ladies, gentlemen, and non-binary friends of the court, welcome to one of the videos of all time. You may be wondering why I'm wearing a tie for this occasion, and that's just because I'm proud that this video is finished. It's the longest video I've ever made, and it's finished. So many hours, so many weeks and months spent on this video, it's finished. And I'm just a proud boy today. The reason I'm making this video is because I love Ace Attorney. It's one of my favorite series of all time, and I definitely have a newfound appreciation of it after this video. Ever since I got back into making videos, I wanted to do something with this series for the longest time, but I wasn't sure what. After seeing so many people rank different types of media, though, I decided. Ranking these cases is not an original idea by all means. There are hundreds of videos and tier lists online all doing the same thing, but I wanted to do it anyways. What I did was replay every single game, write my thoughts about each case as I revisit them, and then rank them at the end of each section. Since I did this all as I went on, some things may be a bit inconsistent, my writing, my delivery, there are editing issues plenty. And while I wish I could go back and do things a little bit differently, I'm still very happy with the final product. What I'm doing today is basically reviewing every game in every case. I've done my best to stay as unbiased as possible, but some biases are unavoidable, so I want to state that this is all my opinion. And because this is all my opinion, I'd like to see if people agree or disagree with my points. Maybe people like some cases more than I did, or vice versa. It'd be fun to start discussions with these games. It should be obvious, but there will be spoilers across the entire series, so it's highly recommended that you've played at least the important ones before starting this video. Or you could watch it without knowing a single thing about the series, in which case I do understand I too am subscribed to Pyro Cynical. Enough preamble, let's start this already. Happy birthday, Ace Attorney, if all goes according to plan. Like I said, I talk about the games and cases all as I go on, and then rank them at the very end. So, let's begin. The case that started it all. It's been a while since I last played through and it's still enjoyable and serves well as an introduction to the game and some of the characters. This is the first of many tutorial cases in this series, so my thoughts on our brief. The introduction of Phoenix as a rookie attorney is well done. He is shown to be both quick-witted when he corners the killer and the foolish fool whoever fooled when answering some of the judge's basic questions. It also introduces Larry, who's just a goofball. Aside from major character introductions, there's not a ton to discuss about this case. It's a simple murder with a simple trial and a simple killer. The cross-examinations aren't as complex as later ones, but they are serviceable in teaching the player how to present evidence. I will say it was a little funny hearing Mia and the super tense music saying, This is it, Phoenix! This is the big time! Are you ready? You need to present evidence now! After I've already played every game in the series. The case as a whole has very low stakes. It's almost a comedic one, if anything. It also only took me around 30 minutes, but it is the very first case, so it's not going to be as long or as tense as later ones. It's an entertaining case that introduces some of the key characters of the game and showcases the main mechanics of the trial system. It succeeds at what it does, and that's good enough for me. Though I don't think the tutorial cases will be very high on my overall list, since they're almost all very basic. Overall, a fun introduction. The second case of the series, and it's a good one. Although it also acts as a tutorial, mainly with introducing the investigative gameplay and showcasing more trial elements, it's a more fleshed out case than the first. It's more tense than the first case too, with the fact Mia is the victim and those close to her are the accused. The tutorial case is more comedic and is serviceable for an introduction, but with this being a fully fledged case, it does a good job of upping the stakes. It also ups the tension by showing the player who the killer actually is, so by the time we see him we just want to put him away. The killer of the case is interesting. I like how pompous and over the top he is and how he plays a role in the overarching Faye storyline. The overall mystery of the case is really simple, and that may be just because I know the answers already, but the tension is still up during the investigations and trial because of what Mr. America is capable of. 
the case introduces several more important characters such as Amaya, Gumshoe, and Edgeworth. They're all handled well in their introductions, but with it being their first appearances, we aren't fully allowed to explore their characters yet. Maya doesn't have a ton of spotlight despite literally being accused of murder. Gumshoe is sort of incompetent, but we don't see a ton of him either. But Edgeworth and his rivalry with Phoenix is introduced well and keeps the players invested with their back and forth in court. Edgeworth is an interesting character in this case since this is the only time, for now, that we really see his guilty verdict at all costs persona. It's not until later where we see his character change and grow into seeking the truth and justice. The case is pretty simple overall, but I don't mind because the introduction of key characters and plot points are what kept me invested. But at the same time, said characters don't get a chance to fully express themselves and their personalities. Still better than the first case. Since we have the full introduction out of the way, let's move on to the cases that actually explore these characters and their personalities and motivations. These cases just keep getting better as the game progresses. While it doesn't directly contribute to the overarching story of the first game, I wouldn't call it a filler case. You'll know when a filler case happens, don't you worry. What it does contribute to the story is with the characters and their personalities. When replaying the first few cases, I knew the characters would be a bit flat because they had just been introduced, but now we have a full case without introductions and can see these people for who they really are. This time around, there are three investigations and three trials, which allows for a lot more banner and interaction between everyone. I was surprised at how much we were able to see Mia in this case. Seeing more of her mentoring Phoenix both in the courtroom and investigations was nice to see. We didn't get a lot of that in the actual tutorial. Our main group of weirdos get a lot more time to shine as well. Maya isn't locked behind bars or depressed anymore, so we can see her energetic and endearing character. The way she and Phoenix bounce off each other is really well done. Gumshoe isn't as incompetent, so we can see him do some real detective work, which was cool to see. He actually cares about his work and wants genuine justice. I can't wait for later cases where we see some of his real hype moments. Edgeworth is a bit of the same as he was in the previous case, but from the second trial onwards we see him change just a bit to where he helps Phoenix corner the killer. Despite the unnecessary feelings he possesses, Edgeworth seeing Phoenix fight for true justice sparks something in him to try and do the same. The murder itself is not as cut and dry as the last few have been, but to me that makes it more interesting to see the story and mystery unfold. I don't think the killer was anything to write home about, but it's interesting to see she didn't have that much ill intent, as it was self-defense, and we don't see a lot of that in the series, actually. The whole Seal Samurai aspect of the case was fun to see as well. I liked how all the young people of the case act when it was brought up, especially Maya. Will Powers is also a good boy, couldn't hurt a fly, and I'm glad we see more of him later on in the series. As said before, these cases just keep getting better and better. The characters are stronger now that we have the introductions out of the way, and we can see them grow and change. The mystery was really well done with an interesting murder, murderer, and murdery. I suppose the only complaint I have is that the amount of menuing in this investigation is annoying. There are so many locations in this TV studio that you have to spend a good minute menuing just to get to a different area. It's overall really good, and now we can move on to the quote unquote finale. This is a really nice conclusion of the game. It takes everything I enjoyed about the previous case and made it better. With this being the final case of the game, I really like how it ties every plot beat together for a satisfying and hopeful ending. One of the main plot points of the first game is the DL6 incident, which involves almost every major character in some fashion. It mainly affects Edgeworth as it's his dad who died in the incident, but it also affected Maya and Mia with their mother, Mr. Grosberg being blackmailed by a Jojo villain, the killer in this case having a social status ruined, even Phoenix was affected by this since Edgeworth leaving made him become an attorney in the first place. I just really enjoy how this case ties everything together. It has a real complete feeling. I like how Edgeworth changed so much throughout the game, first being shown as a cold and heartless prosecutor, and by the end he's a much more genuine and open person. Gumshoe being so determined to prove Edgeworth innocent was really nice to see. We don't have a lot of moments between the two, but they really respect each other. Maya's back to being a little depressed because she's unable to contact Mia and can't help a ton during the trials, but she's still supportive and it was sad seeing her leave at the very end. I haven't talked a lot about Phoenix so far, but this is the case where we hear the most about his past and his motivation. 
It sounds a little extreme to base your career after one event and the one person you knew for only a few months, but it's still believable and understandable why he does what he does. In this first game, Phoenix is not the legendary attorney we see later on in the series, but he's still a well-written character with realistic convictions that get stronger as the series goes on. The first murder of the case isn't anything crazy, I wouldn't even say it's as complex as the previous case, but the second murder with DL6 and Edgeworth's dad is much more interesting. It ties together everything in the game, but the culprit being Von Karma was admittedly a little obvious. It's like he's the final boss of the game because he's been the root of everyone's suffering since the beginning. It's still a well done and believable mystery with high stakes. I really like this case. It's a great conclusion that ties together everything and strengthens these already amazing characters. I learned a while ago that the creator of Ace Attorney, Shu Takumi, initially didn't have any plans to continue the series after this game. It does show in the final release, but that's not a bad thing. This case just completes everything we've seen so far, and that's fine by me. It's my favorite case so far because of that completeness. I'm glad that we have a long way to go before we're done with these characters, though, and we have even more mysterious and tense cases with them. We have just one more to go before we can move on to a new game, so let's see what this upcoming case has to offer and what it adds since this was added after the game's initial conclusion. If I'm being honest, when I was going into this case, I was expecting to not like it as much as the others. I also had some concerns going into this, and I'm only going off my memory for this. This case was written and created after the first three games had already been made, so I noticed a few things in the second game when it came to Edgeworth about what happened to him. From what I recall, everyone in the second game believes he left for no reason. But now, after replaying the first game, it's shown that he did have a reason to leave after the wild events that is this case, and everyone seems understanding of that. I have not touched the second game in a few years as of writing this paragraph, so when we get to that case, we will see if those discrepancies are even noticeable. I just wanted to talk about that because like I said, this case had been made well after the first three games had been complete, and I just wanted to talk about that little inconsistency. I'm surprised to say though I actually like this case. I wouldn't say it's as conclusive as the previous case, but it's still enjoyable. The fact that this case is made well after the other shows, but in a good way. The quality of everything is impressive. There's a ton of new detailed sprites, environments, music tracks, everything. There's more detail on Emma's badge than Edgeworth's face. That's how much the quality has shifted. There are a handful of DS gimmicks, but they don't feel out of place because of the feel of this case. It all revolves around evidence. Forging evidence, concealing evidence, and finding evidence. There were points made in the first game about Edgeworth using extreme methods to solve cases, including using fake evidence. While he isn't the nicest person in the first few cases, it's clear through to this case that he never intended to use fake evidence. His motto has always been to find the truth. Unbeknownst to him, the path to get there just wasn't straight. It's because of these evidence scandals that Edgeworth chooses to leave in the end, and it's set up very well. I really like how he's examined in this case. I just hope this setup doesn't mess up the pre-established payoff like my memory believes. The mystery of the case itself is well done as well, and the use of forensics to solve everything gives this case some of the most interesting investigations yet. I also like the new characters introduced. Even though we won't see them again for three or more games, they're all introduced well and I genuinely like all of them. Emma seems like an extension of Maya though, except instead of spiritual help she provides forensics. They both have bubbly personalities and are accused of murder. I don't think she's a bad character by any means, but I like her more in her later appearances. Damon Gant was funny. I remember I laughed for around 10 minutes straight when I accidentally saved a looping video of him staring and blinking. He is intimidating though. He's like a mix of Red White and Von Karma, a man with immense power and does whatever he can for himself only for himself in the confines of his work. I also like how personal the case feels. Not to Phoenix by any means, but for literally everybody else. I think that's this case's strongest suit, it being so personal to everyone, and because of that they all want to find the real truth. All in all, I really like this case, but for me it comes down a few pegs because of the inconsistencies it causes for later plot points. It also doesn't feel as conclusive as the previous case. I mean, we do see where everyone ends up right before the next game, but it doesn't have that completeness I like so much about the original finale. It's also very, very long, and admittedly confusing at times. I've never gotten so many game overs in one case. Despite these issues, it's one of the best cases so far, just not my favorite of the game.
Although we only have 5 cases to rank thus far, Phoenix Wright Ace Attorney is a game that just keeps getting better as it goes on. The beginning of the game really shows that it's the beginning. The characters are flat at times and don't get a lot of time to develop, but that doesn't mean the cases and characters are bad, they're just basic for now. It's not until the big finale case that these characters and scenarios truly open up. The first game is as good as the first, but because it's the first, the cases aren't as tense or as in-depth as later ones. Good game, and good cases, just not as great as later ones. Now that we have these done, let's do some more with the second game. Our second tutorial case in Who Boy, I didn't care for it that much. Overall, as both a tutorial and a case, I don't think it does good at either. For one, the tutorial aspect is two lines of dialogue that say present evidence and press witnesses, and nothing else. The first tutorial at least had a reason for it being a tutorial, and it did a much better job at conveying what to do and why the characters needed to perform those actions. In this case, Phoenix gets amnesia making him a blank slate. It makes sense in terms of the case, but it feels so lazy. I think if they found a better way of giving a reason for the tutorial, I wouldn't mind it much. Though it is the second game, it has reason to believe the person playing would have already played the first. You don't exactly play games out of order when starting a new series. Me. I can give a pass on the tutorial, but the case itself was, frankly, dumb and very drawn out. It feels like everybody is so incompetent. There are so many things that would seem obvious, but these people just don't see it. You're telling me that somebody with no knowledge of the case could find basic contradictions in the defendant's name and the victim's dominant hand, but not the prosecution in a full investigative team? There was really no way to tell that the broken glasses weren't the defendant's, not even checking the prescriptions. Why was the ending with the phone issue so overly drawn out? And, how did a random person get past security and be able to whack Phoenix over the head with a fire extinguisher in the same lobby where there are always security personnel? These are just a few problems that just tank the enjoyment and immersion for me. I don't think it does anything overtly horrible, but this case is just not great in so many ways. It's my least favorite so far, but I know we have both better and worse to come. Definitely a step up from the previous case. This case shows Maya once again being accused of murder and we have to prove her innocent, but it's not as easy as the last time this happened. The main things I enjoy about this case are the points introduced on the Faye family and the spirit channeling as a whole, as well as the murder itself. Though she isn't the main villain of this case, I like how malicious Morgan Faye is. The status of the Branch family and Pearl seems to be all she cares about, and it's almost scary thinking of the lengths she goes to secure the top spot in the school. Pearl was also cute, not much else to say there. With the murder itself, I really like how it plays out. The introduction foreshadows the identity of the killer, the locker of mystery was interesting to solve, and the motive behind it all was well presented and believable. Just a whole lot of scheming that makes sense and is fun. Not as important as the case itself, but I like the theme that plays throughout. It's a song full of sorrow and it fits the overall tone very well. I didn't mention her in the finale of the first game, but Lotta Hart is a fun character. Her banner between Phoenix and the others is funny, but she still has a Lotta Hart in her. Get it? Do you get it? We have a new prosecutor for this game, and she's great. Franziska von Karma is not the two-dimensional evildoer like her father before, but she still strives for perfection even if it means taking a hit or two from Phoenix. She does do some not entirely legal things in the first trial, but she's not a bad person, I don't think. She has the same beliefs Edgeworth had in the first game, getting a guilty verdict no matter what, but I don't think she's as extreme in following that belief. Sort of. A new gameplay mechanic is shown with the introduction of the Magatama and Cyclox. Essentially, it turns Phoenix into a walking lie detector during the investigations, and you have to prove that a person is lying once you have the information necessary. I think introducing something like this in this case was a good call, since everything is revolved around spirits in the Kurang village. I didn't remember it when revisiting this case, but seeing Mia with her own Cyclops was a great moment. It actually caught me off guard. Overall, a good case. Definitely better than the tutorial. But if there was one thing I had to hate, it would be the weirdo in the doctor's office. Simply put, I hate him, even if he's a joke character. We only have to go there because Lada didn't want to, 
but I think it would have been better if she had just given the information outright. Her whole character is coming up with the next big scoop. Gathering information, gathering dirt, taking photos. It just seems like the better approach instead of this guy. You have to take some bad with the good though, and it was a small moment in all fairness. I still enjoy this case. Can this game start a streak of good just like the first game? We just have to see. When going into this case, I was ready to tear it apart. This is the case that any person who's played Ace Attorney hates with a fiery passion. After revisiting it though, I just feel empty. It's not a good case, and I can't think of any redeemable qualities for it. For a case centered around the circus, you would expect it to be funny, but I swear I was stone-faced the entire time. I chuckled at only two lines of dialogue in the entire case. The murder itself, like the actual crime committed, was admittedly interesting in the way it pulled off, but that's where my compliments end. The characters in this case are genuinely terrible. You have this pompous, arrogant magician who wants to marry a girl who isn't even out of school, and you have this creep ventriloquist who wants to do the same thing. Why was this such an important recurring plot point in the case? I don't want to hear about a 30-year-old with a speech impediment wanting to marry a 16-year-old. It's one thing to have like a two or three year difference in age, but no one in the writing room thought to ask, why does a man want to marry a girl when the man is double her age? Again, why was this so important? Another character is this clown who's not funny at all, and by the end he wants to act mature so the girl can understand what's happening in court. It's just a 180 on his character and doesn't feel genuine at all when paired with the rest of his moments in the case. From what I remember, the anime showed off better characterization than this. I hate all of these people. And then there's the killer himself. His motive for murder is pitiful if you ask me. He wants to get revenge for his brother after the girl played a deadly prank, and because of how she was raised, she doesn't understand how she affected everyone involved. If he wanted her to truly understand the gravity of her actions, he could have just had a conversation with her to make her understand. If he simply talked with her about everything, I'm sure she could have realized. I get her character is to be an airhead, but still, this could have been avoided with one serious conversation. And now we're back to Edgeworth. In a segment with Franziska, we learn that Edgeworth just vanished, and Franziska has it out for Phoenix because of that. But it wasn't even his fault according to the finale of the first game. Edgeworth made it clear in that ending that if he were to leave, it would be by his own accord. I understand that his sudden vanishing was written before that case was made, but they could have tweaked some lines of dialogue in these re-releases to make it fit with the new information. And it's not like you can pretend the new content isn't canon, because characters from that case are brought up several different times in the series. I just wish they changed a couple of things to make his departure seem more natural when considering his reason for leaving. Also, Phoenix is so rude to Maya anytime she asks about Edgeworth, like of course she'd be curious, there's no need to be so hard on her. Essentially, everything I dislike about this case is with the characterization and story. It's all dumb, genuinely dumb, and I feel very hollow after revisiting it. Bad characters, bad motives, weird plot points, horrible music to boot. All in a case where the clown quotes the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. I'm putting it under the tutorial case because it was four hours of pain instead of one. This next case, though, is a hype machine. It hits the ground running faster than any case so far. It was bound to happen eventually, but what if one of Phoenix's clients was actually guilty? This case takes that idea a step further, forcing him to get them a not guilty verdict because of the most insane circumstances. It's almost obvious from the beginning that Matt Ongard is guilty, Everyone knows it, but we have to prove him innocent. I think it's a really cool concept to explore, that a client can be guilty beyond a shadow of doubt, but Phoenix still has to defend them. The reason why he has to defend Matt is what makes this case one of the most exciting and tense in the series. Shelley the Killer is such a cool character to be introduced. He's a literal assassin who takes Maya hostage and forces Phoenix to defend Matt, and the moments where the characters have to dance around the hostage situation are so hype. The moments where the characters are actively pursuing the hostage situation are just as great. Not only is this case the second coming in terms of its premise, but it's also amazing with its characters. At last, fantastic characters and writing, I've missed you so much. One point mentioned throughout is that looks can be deceiving, not everyone shows their true hand, and that point is exemplified with the defendant. 
Matt is first shown to be a clumsy and clueless person, but it doesn't take long to find out that he's truly terrible. On a less evil note, Adrian Andrews is first shown to be a collected person who only relies on herself, but later is shown to be a truly fragile person who needs to depend on others to even function. She gets a happy ending though in finding herself, and that makes me happy. Tampering with a crime scene aside. Another person who found who they truly were was Edgeworth. Throughout the game, Phoenix believed that he was running away after he lost so many trials, but in actuality he was finding himself in what it means to be a prosecutor. This is where he gets his motto of finding the truth above all else. The first game's finale made it seem like this was always his belief despite rumors, and that's why I had such an issue when revisiting both that case and this game. It's like his arc happened a game too early. I can forgive all of that though because of this payoff. Some writing may be clunky because of when these moments were written, but the moments themselves are handled well, and I think they show off some of the best in Edgeworth. Franziska is also a great character. I haven't touched on her as much, but she really is a well-written character. I think the final moments of the game with her and Edgeworth is one of her best. It discusses her beliefs in being a Von Karma and how she can still grow as both a prosecutor and a person. Like I said before, Francisca is like how Edgeworth was in the first game. But it seems after this case, she too knows there is more to being a prosecutor than blindly following one's ideals, not considering anything else. The future is bright for her, as well as almost everyone involved in this case. They've all had great development overall. If I had to talk about something I didn't like, it would be that this case doesn't solve any overarching plot points like the first finale did. But there was no real overarching story the game was trying to tell unlike the first, so there was nothing to tie together in the end. There was the big mystery with Edgeworth, but the box art kind of spoiled the answer of if he would come back or not. I suppose I wish this conclusion was actually conclusive, but it's not this case's fault. I can't complain too much, I still love the way each character was explored and that makes up for it. This case is a hype machine with its main premise, and it's a great case in general because of the characters. It's almost like the writing team knew that they had to end this one with a bang after the disaster that is Big Top. It's simply amazing. Gumshoe sweet! Justice for All is the definition of a mixed bag. These cases make for an okay game as a whole, but each explored individually shows inconsistent quality across the board. The first game did have some growing pains, but it kept up a consistent quality. The same cannot be said here. The lows of this game are very low, but the highs showcase some of the most memorable highs in the series. If the first game had great cases, and the second showcased great character moments, let's see if the third can cap off of the trilogy with both fantastic stories and meaningful characters. Even though I said tutorial cases wouldn't be very high on my list, I have to say this introductory case is really great. Jumping into the past, we get to play as Mia of all characters defending Phoenix, and that alone makes this case interesting. Throughout this trilogy, we've seen Mia help during pressing situations, but never did we see her actually work in court. Seeing the inner psyche of Mia was fun and it fleshes out her character even more. Instead of being this wise grand person in these people's lives, we see that she could be just as witty and headstrong as Phoenix. Phoenix himself was a goofy character in this case to be fair, but his interactions with Mia were still enjoyable. The murder and the trial itself were well paced. For once we don't get an immediate answer of who did it in the intro, and with that we can see the pieces fall into place ourselves as the trial goes on. We already knew Phoenix wouldn't be guilty, but figuring out it was Dahlia who did not just the current murder, but a second not that long before was well done. The reveal would not have had the same impact if the player knew outright she was a killer. I almost consider talking about it a spoiler since I really want to talk about each game case by case, but replaying this first case after already knowing the horrible things Dahlia has done and will continue to do was wild. There's so much foreshadowing in these small exchanges. The discussions of Mia and Dahlia knowing each other were interesting too, since a later case shows what happened with them. These exchanges also keep new players invested. They'd want to learn more about how they're acquainted and why there's so much bad blood in court. 
I suppose I enjoy this case so much because it truly captures what the rest of the game will be like, both in its narrative and the general feel of the game. The reason this case is called Turnabout Memories is because it's a central theme of the game, the past coming back to get you. It's a well-rounded case overall with some great characters, interaction, and it showcases important story beats, all of which will keep the player invested and want to continue playing. It also has an interesting murder that's fun to solve. Everything clicks in your head when reviewing the testimonies and evidence. On my overall ranking, I don't know where to put it just yet, but I can say with certainty it's better than half of the last game. Once again, a good case. I think the premise was interesting. The case doesn't start off immediately as a murder, but instead as a theft. I can only think of a few examples in the series where the reason someone was arrested wasn't because of murder, and that can allow for more interesting and diverse cases although someone does die in the second half. The theft and murder are easy to understand when going about the cross-examinations, at least to me, but once again the characters shine through. The main villain is an over-the-top flamboyant Pinocchio wannabe, and it's satisfying to see his ace detective persona shatter when confronting him. You see, Capcom, you can still write arrogant characters while not making them the most hated thing in your game. The defendant was also fun to watch. He's not the deepest character, and he doesn't have the greatest personality, but his values and motives were realistic and understanding. Adding all of that together creates this absurd person, and he's fun. His wife was also pretty cool. Her daring and exciting personality clashes heavily with her husband's timidness, but their dynamic is sweet and believable. They both have their strong and vulnerable moments, which round out their characters very well. I'm surprised at how much I enjoyed these two, even if this is the only case they appear in. The same goes for the killer good characters all around. Adrienne also comes back with a minor role in this case. She's shown a lot of growth since the finale of Justice For All, and we can finally see her genuine character with a smile. She's great. I genuinely love her character, even if she's not all too important to the story. A new important character, though, is Gado. Gado? Godo? Godo Gado? I've been pronouncing his name in my head as Gado, like Gado, for years, so that's what we're gonna go with for the next 10 minutes. He's a mysterious prosecutor who has both never lost a case and has never held a trial, and yet he's firing on all cylinders. He straight up hates Phoenix, and that is par for the course at this point, but he's much more aggressive than the prosecutors before. He barely acknowledges the points Phoenix makes, not until the very end when Mia appears. Hmm, I wonder why he would listen to Mia and not Phoenix. To me this case was simple, but it's still really enjoyable because of the initial premise in these over-the-top characters. It's a well-rounded case overall with a lot of fun moments. I wish my thoughts on this case weren't so short because it really is enjoyable as a whole. I just kept having to be interrupted when I was playing through it. I hope I can keep going in-depth with the rest of these cases though. With such a strong opening, I'm sure the rest of the game will follow suit. It seems like the series is getting back into the swing of things with good cases once again. Even if this one wasn't super amazing, I still liked it as a whole, and hopefully the game keeps up the same quality. Another good case, but it's probably my least favorite for this game specifically. I don't think these two middle cases are bad or anything, far from it. I just know I'll prefer the intense story-driven cases more than these. To start with the negatives, I think that showing the silhouette of the killer was a bad move. Revealing the identity of the killer in the intro can lead to tense moments like in Turn About Sisters, but here it just makes everything drag on. I think the murder was simple to understand, piecing together the clues led to the easy conclusion of the killer's identity, but revealing that detail in the beginning made me want to get this case over with the longer it went on, because everything was that much more obvious. The mystery was solved the minute the case began. It doesn't even take that long for the player to actually meet the killer, making everything ever more pointless. A less important negative for me is the idea that anyone was fooled to think the tiger was Phoenix in court. But at this point in the series, courtroom shenanigans are plenty and they will continue to be ever prevalent. So who cares? And this is just me nitpicking at this point, but the chef sometimes speaks broken French. And I would know because I've taken French classes for four years. Other than those things, I still think it's an enjoyable case. I just prefer the previous over this one. I think this is our first real gumshoe-oriented case. He didn't have a large role in Justice For All, but he's back in full swing. The case surrounds both him and Maggie, and Gumshoe's shown to genuinely care for her throughout. It's touching seeing the lengths he goes to for her, even if Maggie doesn't see it until the end. I also found it really funny that Gumshoe had a single psych lock because he was embarrassed about the lottery. What a guy. The Tiger was also a kooky character, but I couldn't help but compare him to Red White from the first game. 
Where the tiger deals in money, white deals in information. And honestly, I find white much more intimidating because of the information he possesses. Even if he's a basic character, I prefer his tactics and motives over the tiger's. I mean, money is an incredibly basic motive. What he lacks in intimidation, he makes up by being incredibly imposing, mostly physically. He's so physically imposing, in fact, my game crashed when he was scaring everyone in the courtroom. I was a little disappointed in Gatto, though. I was hoping to see some development from him, just like Edgeworth and Francisca in their third cases, but no, he just hates Phoenix. I know we have some great Gatto moments coming up, though. Can't complain too much. He's still a fun character in court. This case is overall good, but it's my least favorite in this game specifically. The murder and testimonies are easily solved and contradicted respectively, even more so than a lot of the previous cases, and the fact that the killer is shown in the beginning makes it all the more simple. Although it is a simple case, I can't deny it has some good characters and some pretty wild concepts. Just because I don't like it as much as the others doesn't make it a bad case. I think it instead shows the overall quality of this game when my least favorite case is just good. Mia in a maid outfit. This case is about as long as the tutorial, but that doesn't mean it has any less impact than the others. This is the case that further explores the relationship between Mia and Dahlia, as this is Mia's first trial and where the two meet. Their interactions are one of the main highlights of this case. It's not even a returning player's hindsight that makes their interactions so interesting and tense. It's the fact that the player already knows about Dahlia from Phoenix's trial. The player already knows about Dahlia being a bad person. This case just shows them what she's done. Mia's personality was great to see again. It's enjoyable watching her have her own battles and witness how she learns to solve them. As Phoenix grows as a lawyer, Mia is needed less and less in the courtroom. But we can still explore her character by exploring her past. She does have moments where she questions herself and the facts, but just like the man she mentored, she eventually arrives at the unmistakable truth. We get to see Gatto in Mia's life too, except his real name is Diego. His general strategy for mentoring Mia is not too different from how he handles court as a prosecutor, letting everything ride out but making sure everyone is focused on the contradictions. He really focuses on the whys of situations, as the whys will reveal the truth. Mia and Diego's dynamic is sweet and funny, but that all sings when you realize what happens after this trial. We get to see Edgeworth in his courtroom debut with Mia, and he's just as smarmy as you'd think a young Edgeworth would be. He uses the same methods as Von Karma and acts like him too, acting high and mighty while he lays traps and hides evidence from the court. It was fun to see this side of Edgeworth. He contrasts so heavily with his current self and ideals. Even in the first game, he was a little more reasonable. A fun blast for the past for the characters all around. The murder and bits of Dahlia's past were also interesting to learn and figure out. She's downright evil, there's no way around it. I wish we had one investigative segment at least. I'm not sure how it could have worked, but it would have been interesting to see how Mia interacts with things outside of court. The intro makes it seem like she took up the case last second though. Its length makes sense. This case is great. It further develops the relationship between Mia and Dahlia, but also shows Mia's relationship with characters like Edgeworth and Ghetto. The main strength of this case is its characters and their relationships, but that doesn't discredit the murder and the mystery being solved in court. I prefer the tutorial case over this one though, only because that case feels like a more complete package. But the story being told in this case forces it to end abruptly. That ending was insane and completely makes up for the short trial. It was a short case, but a great one overall. I was gonna make a joke in this segment for Farewell My Turnabout and say it's peak and move on to the conclusion, but this case might actually be peak Ace Attorney. This case pulls out all the stops. It has amazing characters and character moments, a well-executed murder mystery, and an amazing story to finish. This is the first case I can confidently say I loved 100% of. To start with its characters, I loved everybody in this case. From new to old ones, everyone is a joy to explore. Misty Faye was an interesting character to learn about. With prior knowledge from the previous games and new information from this case, we get a good feel for her character and what she cares for, and knowing she cares more for her family rather than some title was nice. Iris was sweet. She's the complete opposite of Dahlia in the fact she only wants good for those around her. She only participated in the murder plot because of that fact. She's a genuinely good person and has a good heart. Maya and her struggles with inheriting the title of Master were believable. 
We understand why she feels the way she does after everything she's gone through. Despite it all, she's a strong person because of everyone around her. She may be a goofball at times, but she's our goofball. We get to play as Edgeworth for a bit, and seeing his reactions to the spiritual aspects of the case were great. Outside of that segment, he helps a lot during the investigations, and he's just great to see again, as well as his perspective on spirit channeling. Francisca helps even more during the investigation since she accompanies Phoenix the entire time. She's grown a fair bit since Justice for All, and I'm glad she's back to show that growth through her interactions between everyone. The more casual banner between her and Phoenix was fun, but seeing them discover more clues and piece together the scenario was also interesting. We mainly ever see the puzzling perspective from Phoenix, so it was cool to see the same perspective from both Edgeworth and Francisca. Gatto being the killer was very sad when I first played the case several years ago, but now it feels right. The whole reason he came back was because of this case, and now that he's put Dolly in her place once and for all, he wants to know if Phoenix can prove it and truly be the man that Mia mentored. After the previous case, we know that Gatto and Mia cared for each other so much, and knowing that he had to protect her family at all costs makes it all the more bittersweet. Mia doesn't have a ton of presence in this case, but when she does, she makes it known. Her big moment is when she finally condemns Dahlia for her actions, and it's one of the best moments in the game. Mia is so raw, she exercises a spirit in the middle of court that's crazy! This is the game and case that Phoenix really shows what he's capable of. His belief is to trust in others until the very end, because the truth will make itself known. In these three games, Phoenix has been growing as both an attorney and a person, but he couldn't do it alone. At the end, he follows in his mentor's footsteps and finds the truth on his own, resulting in probably the hardest moment in the series. All of these people have come a long way, and it was especially satisfying to see Phoenix find his own path just like everybody else. The murder itself was fun to solve and really gets your gears turning. The first half with solving the mystery of the courtyard was well done, and the second half with the mystery of the garden was just as well executed. None of these revelations come out of nowhere. Everything clicks when reviewing the information the player is presented with, making for a satisfying mystery to solve. The story is wrapped up very nicely in this finale. The trilogy explores the Fae family and what terrible things have come from it, and this case really shows the worst of the worst. It isn't without its merit though, because this conclusion shows a bright future for the Karain school with Maya being the new master and those surrounding her keeping the world just. The game specifically is nicely wrapped up with this case as well. The mystery of both Dahlia and Ghetto are solved and we see how their lives ended up like this and why they did what they did. It was so satisfying seeing Dahlia literally sent to hell by Mia's hand. The pain she caused everyone is over, and now, the lawyers can cry knowing it's finished. I think I showed why I liked this case so much. The characters are fantastic, both new and old. The way everyone relates together makes sense, and their stories and arcs are very investing. The murder itself is nothing to scoff at. The methods used by the conspirators and the killer were both crazy and well done. Nothing seems out of place or random when actually solving the crime. You don't have to suspend your belief so much that it almost doesn't make sense. Everything works just right. The case in general is a fantastic conclusion that leaves no mystery unsolved. Everything is over, and these people have grown tremendously over these games. It's not a shock to say that this is my favorite case, and it might stay that way until the end of this ranking. Trials and Tribulations is fantastic. The cases and stories in this game are easily some of my favorites in the series, making for a very enjoyable time. Sure, the cases that don't relate to the overarching story aren't my favorite, but each one is bursting with charming characters to explore and fleshed out mysteries to solve. I'm happy to tell myself two weeks ago that yes, this game capped off a wonderful trilogy with a great overall story and some of the best character moments in the whole series. 
This truly was the Phoenix Wright Ace Attorney trilogy released on pretty much every modern platform that you should try right now if you haven't already. This really is a great game though. I loved almost everything about it and it shows what makes this series so special. However, I don't think it's a good idea to play all of these in such a short time span. My head hurts really bad. At this point, Capcom seemed to catch on to the growing popularity of the series and decided to capitalize on it by making a few spin-off games. I'll be looking at these next because chronologically they take place in between the mainline games. So let's see if they can reach the same quality that this original trilogy did. Alright, we have a new style of games to discuss. In this game, we play as Edgeworth primarily conducting investigations, and explore crime scenes in much more depth than before. We can interact with the environments in a third-person point of view which allows the in-depth investigations. The original games only had investigations with flat backgrounds and they worked, but being able to actually move around the environments and examine areas and evidence is a lot more immersive. More changes come with Edgeworth himself and how he investigates. Instead of pointing out lies that piece together the truth like Phoenix, Edgeworth quite literally puts together the clues to gain new information. I think this was implemented well. Instead of only making headway by talking to witnesses, we can solve the case by piecing together the information we have. It's kind of like how the player could have mentally solved cases by piecing together information, but the characters would have to solve it in court. Because this is an investigation, both the player and the characters can better piece together the clues and directly confront the contradictions, rather than only being able to contradict testimonies. We still have testimonies despite it being an investigation, although the arguments can sometimes feel forced. This isn't a courtroom, I don't think there's a real need to spout objections over and over again. I hope that isn't an issue when going into later cases. There were only a few characters in the case and I think they were all good. Gumshoe returns and Maggie is a fun addition, but the killer was kind of basic. We never learn his true motives and his whole personality is to be sporty and full of himself. Edgeworth himself is cool to see though. His personality is always great to see, and the way he conducts investigations in his own game is interesting. The gameplay really fits his character. I'm surprised people can take him seriously though. Bro says Eureka unironically. I also like how right from the get-go there seems to be an overarching story starting with the introduction of a secret organization in the mysterious Yadagarasu. I don't know if I pronounced that correctly, if you couldn't tell already, I'm a very white. I think this case is pretty good. For the start of a new sub-series, it does a good job standing apart from the original games with its main gameplay and general premise. Although the one new character was basic, this case lays the groundwork for an interesting story to tell. Can this be the start of a great game? Possibly. I think it's worth talking about the actual crimes and investigations more in these games because this is where we will spend all of our time, conducting investigations. I realize I talked a lot about the characters and stories in the last game and less so about the actual mysteries, so I want to rectify that by discussing them in these cases. To start with the location, I really like the fact that it takes place on the plane. It's a unique location to have a crime scene. A place like an office is a very average murder location, but an aircraft allows for more varied areas. It's also a limited space, meaning that the killer or accomplices can't leave to a completely separate area to do something else. This forces the player and the characters to take everything into account when it comes to the plane. I also just generally like the aesthetic in this pixelated art style. It's nice. The crime and mystery were both executed very well, and new environments and evidence always keep the player thinking. The idea of a piggy bank being a murder weapon was suspicious right out the gate, and exploring more areas of the plane slowly ruled that out as a possibility. The gameplay loop is literally information clicking once you have the right details, but once the group gets to the cargo hold, everything actually clicks. Albeit in a comedic manner, it all starts in the bar area, and everything shown in the beginning makes perfect sense by the end in the cargo hold. It's a well pulled off mystery, and the motives of everyone involved are believable. The killer is involved with a secret smuggling organization that the victim was investigating, so she had to kill him. I like how this game is creating an overarching story that continues to develop case by case. It doesn't follow the same episodic format as the original games because it's its own thing. The killer's motives behind this case and the previous relate to the smuggling organization, so I wonder how the game will continue to develop this narrative. In all honesty, I've forgotten a lot from this game, so I'm genuinely curious. 
When you get down to it though, this case is kind of simple. The game really likes to highlight words and phrases so much so the player couldn't possibly get anything wrong. I don't think that's inherently a bad thing, but I would have preferred if some stuff was left open to the player instead of the characters being very obvious about the answers. It would have been a more satisfying mystery. Aside from that, I don't have any complaints, and the characters in this case were fun overall. Before she got all serious when being confronted like every witness ever, I just found the killer to be really funny. She looks blitz out of her mind at all times. I like this case a lot. Since the investigations are one of the most important parts of this game, it's good that the crime and mystery were executed well. I also like the vibe of this case with its location, the story being further developed was nice to see, and the characters were just fun. I really don't remember liking this game a ton, but so far I'm actually enjoying it. I am now starting to not enjoy the game so much. This case was really weak compared to the opening ones in my opinion. The atmosphere was boring, the murder mystery was incredibly basic, the characters were all just there, the story goes nowhere, it's just a really weak case. Like I said before, I think the locales and premise are interesting, but I don't think this case brings those ideas to their full potential. Every area is a small, empty patch of land with only a few areas and rooms that are actually important. It's just a boring setting. I haven't talked about the openings much, but the previous case had an incredible opening sequence. It's tense, colorful, and it has creative shot composition. As well, from a storytelling perspective, it shows that the player is about to experience something very important that will relate to the first case. The opening for this case is drab, boring, and not tense in the slightest. The opening of the case doesn't have to be tense if that's not the feel they want to go for, but they were clearly going for a tense feeling. When Edgeworth gets assaulted, I didn't tense up, I smirked. This is one of the dumbest and funniest images in the series, which sucks because it's not supposed to be. The kidnapping incident and murder mystery were also incredibly basic and easy to solve. It doesn't help that both incidents are pretty boring, but there's also the fact that they're so simple and obvious. When I find contradictions or learn new facts, I don't have an aha moment. I have an, is this game really wanting me to answer this incredibly basic question moment. Edgeworth's unique investigation style doesn't help much either. The novelty of his gameplay doesn't make anything any more fun when all you're doing is answering very basic questions. Oh wow, I wonder how this door was broken. It sure is a conundrum. And I also wonder where the missing costume went. Better whip out the logic orbs for this one. These mysteries aren't fun to solve, and they aren't interesting at all. But come on, at least the characters are good! Eh. I was hoping the characters could make up for a basic mystery. I mean, some cases I liked solely because of their characters. And with the previous case having some fun characters, I was hoping the same quality of writing would be present, but no. The case-specific cast is boring, and the new key characters aren't all too interesting. I guess I liked Kay and Lang's personalities, but that's about it. Emma comes back for literally five minutes and vanishes, and Gumshoe has had almost zero presence in the game so far despite being Edra's right-hand man. I don't get why they're so shafted, they're good characters. The story that I've been invested in also goes nowhere until the very last minute of the case. A few lines of exposition are thrown in before the ending screen, and that's it. No real story development is seen. There's really only one word I can use to describe this case, and that word is boring. It doesn't do anything all too impressive on any front. Not with the premise, mystery, characters, or story. I guess that would make this case a safe one. It's not horrible or infuriating, but just safe and bland. I do hope that this is just a hiccup at an overall good game. Now if you excuse me, I'm gonna go play a different game before I finish the one I'm playing right now, further delaying my progress on this video. After that fun 40 hour detour, I was expecting to come back and slowly dislike this game more and more, but I actually thought this case is pretty decent for the most part. It doesn't reach the same highs as the opening cases in my opinion, but it's more enjoyable than the previous. We are once again heading back to the past to explore Edgeworth's first case and I like the idea. I really enjoy seeing these people at different stages in their lives. Because of everything we know about Edgeworth's courtroom history, I was expecting to see him make some questionable decisions, but he doesn't do anything illegal. He just wants perfection just like a certain whip-happy individual. Franziska was fun to see again. We did see her in the second case with the plane, but here she has a much larger role. I know I said I wanted to focus more on the actual crimes when discussing these games, but my favorite part of this case is seeing how Edgeworth and Francisca interact with each other. They're basically siblings. They bicker and squabble over petty things, but they know they care for each other when they have to put that pettiness aside. 
It was also just fun seeing kid versions of them and comparing how they act to their adult selves. Gumshoe has a slightly more important role in this case. The judge was really funny, and Detective Mad was also really cool, plain and simple. The reason I really only liked the characters was because the crimes and mystery weren't too interesting. They don't feel important when looking at the case as a whole and its general structure. We spend the beginning examining the crime scene, then on how Gumshoe didn't do it, then there's exposition on the Yadagarasu, and then we catch the killer at the very end. It feels like the crime scene isn't a priority, but instead everything else surrounding it. The entire middle section is just how Gumshoe was being Gumshoe, and most of the ending was about the Yadagarasu. Not much else is explored about the murders and motives until literally the very end. I should also emphasize how basic the investigations have been lately. The few sections that aren't story-driven don't have much critical thinking because the overall mystery is made so simple by the characters and their very obvious leading questions. I wouldn't say it's so obvious it's infuriating like Injustice for All, but it's simple enough to where I lose interest when we get back to the actual investigations. This game is called Miles Edgeworth Investigations, but so far only one case has had an enjoyable investigation and interesting mystery to crack. I don't think this case is bad, I enjoyed it more than the previous by a wide margin, but that's only because of the characters. I guess I also like the courthouse setting, this way the testimonial segments don't feel as forced as they have been. Besides that, I can't think of much else I really enjoyed about this case. I'm going into these spin-offs wanting to be more invested in the actual crimes and mysteries surrounding these people, because they should be the focus, but so far I haven't been all too interested in them. Each finale has been stellar, though. I have some hope that this next case will be just as good and will have an investing mystery while also wrapping up the story of the Yadagarasu and smuggling ring. My memory is telling me otherwise, but I want to be optimistic. Never mind, my memory was correct. This case wasn't all that great. I've been trying my best to find something to talk about in every one of these cases, even the bad ones, but I think this is the first that I don't have a lot that I actually want to say about it. It's not the worst, the amusement park case is my least favorite of this game, but it certainly doesn't live up to the other finales. It's so long, boring, and uninvesting, I was just waiting for it to end for the longest time. I don't care for it. The good I have to say about this case is that I liked how they wrapped up the story. Like I said, this is the first game that tells a story that develops over the course of it instead of episodically, which puts a nicer bow on the ending. Even though I like the complete feeling of this case, with the story, I can't say that I actually liked the story itself. It's just so uninteresting. The beginning of the game had a promising and investing start, both with the smuggling ring and Yadagarasu stories, but as it went on I just stopped caring. The characters don't make up for a lacking story this time. New characters have kooky personalities, but I honestly don't care for them either. The murders and overall mysteries of this case weren't too interesting. As I write, I'm slowly forgetting the important parts and only remember how infuriating some of the investigative segments were. I was always on the right track because all of these cases have had really simple mysteries, but the requirements of solving them get annoying sometimes. When they investigate the mysterious green flames, the answer of their source is so obvious, but instead of being able to present the oil, you have to present a lantern first? even though either piece of evidence should yield the same answer? Something similar happens when they examine a photo and there's a flower matching a flower petal, but you have to present the knife instead of the petal? No one makes a comparison to the two until like three hours later, which is just annoying because the player has known the connection for such a long time. Near to the ending, you have to examine a videotape and see a one-of-a-kind medallion in the reflection of the window, but that's not what you're supposed to be looking at, apparently. Even though the characters are trying to identify the head of the smuggling ring. I just showed who it was, but the game says no once again. I'd use a guide several times in this playthrough because of situations like these. The answer is right there and is so obvious, but you have to present or examine other pieces of evidence in a weird order until the characters say Eureka or something. What makes the investigation even weirder is that the whole thing is solved by hot dogs. Hot dogs are what catch the killer in the end. I mean, a parrot is what caught the killer at the end of the first game, but I can take that more seriously because that didn't come out of nowhere. The hot dogs did. I didn't care about this case all too much, like I said. I don't even want to get into the nitty gritty like I have with every other case because I do not care. It's uninteresting, it's too long for its own good, the overall story was mediocre, and the specifics of this case were so bland and uninteresting. The gameplay also sucked because there are so many times where you know you're correct, but you have to jump through a bunch of hot dog shaped hoops first. 
It's not the worst case this game has to offer, but that doesn't mean it's any great. Miles Edgeworth Investigations could have been a very promising experience, but it ultimately falls short as it goes on. What I mean is that the tools were already in place, but they were not used to their full potential. Key characters returning is a plus, and exploring them in new ways could have been more interesting, but the only thing we ever explore are their personalities that we know all too well by this point. New characters aren't the best either. I could only name a few that I found memorable and enjoyable. A new style of gameplay is also a welcome addition, but the game doesn't do a ton with it. In fact, this new gameplay style hinders and drags some sections of the game like I said in previous segments. An overarching story that develops as the game goes on instead of in episodic parts also sounds cool, but the story is just plain boring to me. I think it's for these reasons that the sequel never received a translation. This has never stopped people from experiencing media before though, as a fan translation was eventually created. I'll be looking at this next to see if these concepts could have actually been interesting if utilized in a better way. The team could have learned from their mistakes to make an overall better experience, or they could have done more of the same with a new coat of paint. Let's see which is the case. After the average experience of the first Investigations game, I was a little skeptical to see what this game had in store, but like before, I thought the intro case was good. I think it's a much better intro case than the one before, but that doesn't mean it's going to be super high on the final list or anything. The fake assassination plot was interesting and the motives of the murder are believable and realistic, but the murder mystery itself wasn't as investing to me. Solving these mysteries is just as simple as before. So simple, in fact, that you present the same piece of evidence several times in the ending. It feels like there's a lot of repetition in what's being said, or they state the obvious like it's a grandiose revelation. The killer's prints were on the gun, which means the killer's prints were on the gun. Which, theoretically, means the killer's prints were on the gun. So we must present the gun for the tenth time to catch the killer who, might I add, had his prints on the gun- That's what the ending feels like when thinking about it if I'm being honest, and I only finished this case an hour ago as of writing this. Despite the repetition and lacking mystery, the characters are what bring this case up for me. I found the killer to be interesting mainly because of how over the top he was with his weapon of choice. Ace Attorney killers can be threatening, but I don't think many have straight up pointed guns at the protagonist. He's a riot. Even more interesting was the return of Shelly the killer. The player is just sitting there waiting for him to crack the ice cream facade, and when he does, he becomes one of the best parts of this case. But then he leaves leaving a lot to be desired if I'm being honest. A small gripe I have with the case and the game in general is that the name puns aren't super witty. I know, super important. Knightly, Rook, Simon Cowell. Huh? Speaking of unbearable chess references, I thought logic chess was neat. You can't always beat your opponent with evidence, but there's always the magic of words. Those are my thoughts on the case. I don't have a conclusion sentence because I can't think straight all the time. There may even be segments later on without scripts because I don't have the time or patience. Who knows? I'm making this giant video all as I go on, so I can't say. Overall, the case is good, but it's still lacking in the mystery and investigation department like last time. It somehow took me over two weeks to finish this case. It really felt like I was forcing myself to finish it due to a general lack of motivation. I don't think that means this case is bad, I think it's on par with the intro, but it felt like a chore for me to finish it. Could it be that the burnout of playing these games, writing about them, and editing is starting to catch up to me? Could it be the fact I have to play this game on my phone and I hate playing games on my phone? Or could it be that I just wasn't super invested? Who can say? I think the murder mystery was interesting and the way everything happened makes sense. I liked learning about the weird contraption the defendant created and how it ties to the murder. That was neat. I also liked how this case has a lot of callbacks to the prior games. The setting is in a prison, which means previous killers can be seen throughout the case. You can even see the parrot from the end of the first game making a small cameo. I remember not liking Courtney and Sebastian when I first played the game a few years ago, but I actually found them quite enjoyable this time around. Sebastian is just stupid and I love it. Courtney was actually interesting though. Her character calls back to and conflicts with some of the themes from the previous game, about how sometimes you have to go beyond the law to reveal the truth. She, on the other hand, respects the law above all else, which conflicts with those themes. I just thought that was interesting. 
Ray Shields was a very fun character. He really is the fun uncle type, but he knows when he has to be serious. Sometimes. He's a defense attorney who worked under Edgeworth's father, and that fact challenges Edgeworth throughout the case. His father was an attorney, but he is a prosecutor. So being Ray's assistant puts him in the shoes of his father. I haven't done much character analysis so far, but I like how this case challenges Edgeworth on which path he should walk. I also like how his father seems to take on a much more important role in this game, rather than just being a talking point to remind players that he's dead. I think this case is overall good just like before. It has an interesting murder and believable motives, good characters and character moments, and fun callbacks. I do think the previous case was a little more exciting, though. These two really are on the same level in terms of enjoyment for me. Me taking so long to finish it also hindered my enjoyment, I suppose. I'm barely a third of the way finished with this project, and this is what stumped me of all cases. Wait, what's that music playing? No, 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 no! Now this is the case that comes to mind when I think of the investigation games. The Crown Jewel, La Tour de Force, Le Piste de la Resistance. This is my favorite case within these two games. I love everything about it. The atmosphere, the mystery, the story, the characters, everything was wonderful. It's a fun time in general, but it has just as many emotional moments. The setting is a literal eye candy. Every room is so colorful and vibrant because it's based around confectionaries and sweets. When the setting changes into a museum, the colors are still there, and I love the blues thrown all over the place. I made a throwaway joke almost an hour ago when talking about some of the sprite work in the first game, but I think this case also shows off a lot of great character design and animation. Kate's design is so colorful and her dancing animations are just fun, and with her general sprites you can feel the emotion in her facial expressions. I just think her design is solid. And we'll get into the more important reason why I like him, but I also like Gregory's design and sprite work. He's so cool and mature it's almost funny sometimes. When he gets backed into a corner, he shows the face of a man who's impressed but won't go down easily, and not the face of a certain two men who want to die when they're cornered. He looks like a confident and serious attorney, but he's over here worried about his hairstyle. Don't worry, you're killing it, man! The mysteries of both the past and present are handled well, and I love how they intertwine with one another. When one thing happens in the past, you think about how it relates to the present, and vice versa. Aside from that airplane case, this is the only other case in these two games I've actually had fun solving, and it's not super simple like all the others. It's just a solid murder mystery. The sherbet being a recurring talking point in the case makes the player think that there's more to it than just being used for sculptures. And then the characters learn it was used to hide the body among other pieces of evidence. It makes sense in the context of the case and it was fun to figure out. The plotting done by the killer is also well done. He did everything to try and point to this pharmacist lady and it almost worked. She looks so suspicious until you learn who the real bad guy is. He comes very close to getting away with it, but instead he gets the patented final piece of evidence thrown in his face. The story and characters of this case are really what make it one of my favorites. It ties back to the final case Gregory worked on before he was killed by Von Karma, and every aspect of this case feels so personal to Edgeworth because of that. I loved playing as Gregory throughout the case. It's refreshing to see him have importance and experience his character instead of, again, only being reminded of his death in each new game. Ray was also fun, both in the past and present. Him learning his tactics from Gregory and teaching those methods to Edgeworth was cool to see. Uncle Ray is a generally fun character, but I like how he's more serious in this case. This whole situation is just as personal to him as it is Edgeworth. Master and Kate were also highlights for me. I love their dynamics between every character they come across, and they're just fun. I can't help but have a stupid smile on my face when they sing and every character joins in. Everyone else is fun, I like them all. I just wish Gumshoe had an ounce of importance. He's a Gumshoe! But he's been sidelined so hard in these two games. I'm also just not a fan of K. I'm really not. I'm sorry to all 10 of you K stands out there. Overall, I think this might be my favorite case in these two games. Great atmosphere, wild mystery, fun characters, and an investing story. It's just great in so many ways. I don't know how high up it'll be on my final list, but it may be up there. I wasn't expecting this case to be bad or anything, but when starting it, I was not expecting to enjoy it a ton. 
As I've stated a few times, I have not cared for Kay's character, and a case centered around her character was not something I was looking forward to. Though to my surprise, I actually like this case. It's not on the same level as the previous, but it's my second favorite in this game so far. It wasn't even a Kay-oriented case like my memory believed. It actually felt more Edgeworth-oriented than anything. Throughout the game, Edgeworth has been threatened by the PIC because of the way he conducts his investigations, how he handles his reasoning, and just generally being in the way of an evil person's schemes. Because of the stakes in this case, Edgeworth chooses to relinquish his badge so he won't be threatened by the PIC trying to hide the truth. The reason he throws away his badge is because it's in the way of finding the truth behind the case and Kay's missing memories. The reason I thought this case would be Kay-focused was because of her memory loss, but it's not that important when looking at the case as a whole if I'm being honest. I really like the murder mystery and how it ties to this mysterious black market with police evidence. That little room is full of trinkets from previous cases. Almost every inch of the room is a reference to something. The case slowly moves away from Kay's memory loss and turns the focus onto the situation surrounding the black market, which I just found to be an interesting concept. There are plenty of high-ranking people in the series who have done terrible things. An underground black market with police evidence? That's just a normal Thursday! I also liked how Courtney helped the gang in the last part of the case to put away Blaze. That was a cool moment. We see her resolve isn't only to follow the law by any means necessary, but instead to try and use those laws to find the truth. Seeing Sebastian be verbally abused by his father was a real gut punch, though. That conversation at the end completely transformed some scenes from prior moments in the game. Francisco returning was a neat addition, and her conflicting views of her own father resonate with Sebastian. Maybe that comparison wasn't intentional, everyone loves Francisca, so it was a no-brainer to bring her back, but it makes sense to reintroduce her in this case given the circumstances. I don't have a ton more that I want to say about this case. I actually liked it a fair amount when putting my K-Biases aside. Before we move on to the finale of these two spin-offs, allow me to play some bangers. I have no idea where else I can talk about music, I just wanted to play some songs that I thought were pretty good. I was cautiously optimistic about the finale of the previous game, and I was blown away by how boring and tedious it was, but the quality of this game has been so high that I wasn't cautious at all. This case is fantastic, but I don't know if I liked it slightly more or slightly less than the case revolving around Gregory. Both cases are generally on the same level of quality, which is great. I think what stuck out to me the most was the intro revolving around Sebastian and his father. Like I said in the previous case, it was a real gut punch seeing how the two interacted, but it was a wonderful moment to see Sebastian best his father once and for all. I think my favorite logic chess segment of the game was when Edgeworth was trying to calm Sebastian down and lead him down the right path. He's not entirely an idiot, he just gets confused at times. Putting those feelings of confusion and worthlessness on top of the treatment he gets from his father shapes how he views his problems and how he tries to solve them which doesn't go well most of the time. Through Edgeworth's words, Sebastian finds his own worth and ability to confront the issues in front of him, which culminates in him finally surpassing his father. He truly is a culpable individual. I just enjoyed his character arc throughout the game. It's set up and pulled off so well. Everyone else was a treat as well. Edgeworth, Ray, Courtney, Franziska, everyone was fun. Everyone seems to have shown some real growth after this case and find their own paths in life, as well as their sense of justice. When discussing case-specific details, I think it had a very interesting murder mystery and conspiracy. Slowly piecing together that Simon was the one behind the scenes was such a good moment, and the final confrontation with him where everything is laid bare was just as intense and fun. His witness breakdown is easily one of my favorites, it's so funny. Simon's reason for doing all of this was for revenge, and in a way you could say he was in the right, but his methods were not justified. 
These two games have had many discussions of those the law cannot reach, those who twist the law for their benefit, those who use the law for their own selfish desires. So much talk about corrupt individuals in the legal world that you can't entirely blame Simon for what he did. What he did was wrong. Very wrong. But he was ultimately driven to that point by those around him. There's a moment in the ending that relates to these points when Edgeworth says that he wants to save people like Simon in the future by preventing people from twisting the law and saving those affected by their selfishness. Ultimately, I do enjoy this case, but there are a couple of imperfections. Specifically, two journalists who get way too involved in others' business. Listen, I've always loved Lada. She's a fun and funny character, but when you double her annoying attributes and constantly have her and her apprentice in the way of the case, it may or may not be a chore to have to deal with them. A large portion of the beginning has to do with them thinking that Godzilla-sized monsters are real. There's a certain point where their absurdity stops being charming, but instead a hindrance. Lada has a funny walk cycle, though. That's my only real issue with the case. I still enjoy it a ton overall. When thinking it over though, I think the case with Gregory takes the top spot because of its emotional core. I love this case. It's a wonderful conclusion to these two games with a lot of great character moments and fun conspiracies. While there are a few flaws, it's still leagues better than the previous finale. It's been over 12 years since we last saw Detective Gumshoe! He barely had a presence in this case and he feels so poorly written. He is 100% capable of performing without Edgeworth as shown in the second and third games of the original trilogy. I don't understand why in these games he absolutely needs Edgeworth. And even then, he's been benched! Answer my emails, Capcom! Prosecutor's Path was a fun time. It's a solid game as a whole and the cases themselves are all handled well. I'm glad that the cases range from just good to great like in Trials and Tribulations, showing that it's just a solid experience all around. I think it does a great job as a sequel as well. I'd even go as far as to say that it does a better job of being a sequel to the first Investigations game than how Justice For All was to the first game in the series. The quality shift is night and day, first being shown as a mediocre spin-off series, to now having a genuinely great entry in the series as a whole. It's a real shame that this didn't get a proper translation from Capcom themselves. I'm sure some things could be tweaked here and there to be a little more in line with the official games, but I think the translation group did a phenomenal job at localizing the game so more people could experience it. I don't think there needed to be a third Investigations game. It would have been cool to see some of these characters one last time, but this game concludes everyone's arcs and stories in such a strong way that a third entry really isn't necessary. The final spin-off game we'll look at is handled a bit differently than any game I've discussed so far, so I'm curious of how I'll structure that entire segment, and how good of a job the game itself does at tying together two gameplay mediums to create entertaining cases and an overall good story. My expectations aren't the highest because of the nature of the game, but I'd like to be proven wrong and have a fun time here too. I'll have to solve that puzzle in... I've been both looking forward to and worried about starting this game ever since I first started this project simply because of the way it's structured. It's not handled episodically like every other Ace Attorney game, but instead goes by chapters like the Professor Layton series. I think I have a good idea of how I can talk about this game though, so it'll be fine. I think this introduction was decent overall, though I have some caveats only because I've already finished this game once before. I'll explain my issues as they become relevant later on, but for now, this case was a fine enough introduction. I think I enjoyed Leighton's section more than the trial, though. I liked seeing him and Luke chase after the mystery of the witches and their reactions to the supernatural. I wish we could have seen Phoenix and Maya's reactions to the witches too, considering they're well versed in the spiritual world by this point. I also enjoyed the investigative gameplay with Leighton because of the puzzles. They're simple, but still charming. The trial section with Phoenix wasn't bad by any means, but I was less interested in it overall. I think that's because it's a simple trial. The reason it's simple to me, especially after binging the Ace Attorney series for months, is because it's trying to be accessible to those who have only played the Professor Layton series. It's not on Frank Sawitz's level of simplicity, but it is a basic and ultimately less interesting trial to me. 
As an introduction to a story-driven experience, I think it does a great job. It poses many questions that leave the player scratching their head. What are the witches? What is the book? Who are these characters? The player will want to continue playing to answer these questions. As an introductory case though, it's a middle-of-the-road experience for me. It's not bad by any means like I said, but it is a bit basic. I also have issues with it when looking at the game as a whole, but that's a whole can of worms I'm not opening right now. Overall, it's a decent case, and I will give some points to it for being an accessible introduction for both series. As the start of a crossover, it has to start out a bit basic, but hopefully we can now move on to more investing concepts and mysteries. There are still a couple issues in this part of the ranking that stem from this being a story-driven game, but overall, this case is an improvement from the one before. In the investigative section, we learn more about the strange town of Labyrinthia, and I liked seeing Leighton's reactions to this new world. Everywhere he turns, something isn't right, but everything is accepted as fact to the townspeople. The witch's existence, magic being common knowledge, the storyteller being a sort of oracle. Everything makes sense to them, but any person from the modern day would think they're crazy. Things get even weirder when Phoenix and Maya think they're ace bakers, and yet they have the same personalities and mannerisms as before they lost their memories. The questions keep piling on top of one another, and I think it was a good idea to keep Leighton normal during this part because of these questions. Phoenix and Maya would have had much different and less appropriate reactions to the current circumstances. Leighton keeps a much cooler head than those two. I also liked when he investigated the archives and the librarian gets all fired up when discussing puzzles. She was fun and I like her design. Switching to Phoenix, I love how the trial sections are handled. This is the Middle Ages, which means stuff like cameras, forensics, and slightly more accurate testimony are nowhere to be seen. These small changes completely flip how cases can be written and explored by the characters. The trial could have ended in minutes if they could analyze fingerprints, but Phoenix doesn't have that luxury anymore. The fact these cases take place in a new world where magic is common knowledge also adds a lot of properties to the mystery. Different spells are discussed, the properties of them, how they're used. These points drastically affect facts presented in the trial, and I just think that's cool. I also found it interesting how this court has multiple witnesses on the stand talking all at once. It's funny to see them squabble with each other when the facts don't line up. It's also a clever addition gameplay-wise because we see that their reactions to each other expose contradictions or reveal new facts. Simply changing the time period and amount of people talking sound like small changes, but they allow for more creative mysteries to unravel. Overall, this case is pretty good. It's a definite step up from the introduction now that these characters are in a new world with strange rules and properties. I really enjoy seeing the characters try to answer these questions logically while working around their current circumstances. A couple of closing notes I have is that Leighton's introduction in the trial was so cool. Anytime he opens his mouth, he completely destroys the Inquisition's arguments. And it was a surprise to hear Fiora's voice actress as the witch in this case. Different characters, same voice, same fate. No! I just wanted to say that none of these cases have had proper titles like normal cases, so cut me some slack with the titles that I put on the screen. I just put what I thought was most fitting for each one. So far, I've been more interested in the investigative sections than the trials, but it's actually the other way around for this case. It felt like the investigative segment was mostly exposition for the storyteller, but we did have some fun Maya and Luke interactions as well. I suppose I could talk about how I love the aesthetic and atmosphere of this game instead of the more streamlined investigation. It would be hard to blend the more realistic characters of Ace Attorney with the more stylized world of Professor Layton, and vice versa. So it was cool to see the workaround for that was to put these characters in a distinct setting with its own art style. The game is visually gorgeous no matter where you turn. Every location is full of charming details that fit in this setting. I also really like the animated cutscenes. They are animated beautifully and showcase wonderful character moments. The music is also incredible. I haven't gotten many chances to discuss music in any of these games, but man is the soundtrack solid. It has the heart of the Professor Layton series with the instruments used, but also the excitement of the Ace Attorney series with how they're used. This game easily has some of my favorite songs out of both series. Many of my favorites come from the trial sections, which is what I enjoyed most about this case. 
I do have a couple of small issues, but they don't impact my overall enjoyment of this case. Leighton and Maya's supposed deaths don't hit as hard as they could've. Their situations are incredibly tense, yes, but you know they'll be fine because this is a crossover game. Luke's reactions to everyone talking about Leighton did hit me, though. I genuinely felt bad for him, even if we already know that Leighton is completely fine. The phrase, the butler did it, may turn people off from the mystery of this case. It's such a cliché, but the story and mystery are so much more than that. I loved unraveling the mystery of the alchemist's death. It sounds like it could have been no one else except for his daughter, but I was so glad to figure out that it wasn't actually her. As much as I disliked the constant interruptions during the trial from the drunk guy, his testimony actually helped solve the mystery of the alchemist's suicide. In that ending, man, I think that was the first time I actually got emotional when revisiting these games. Jean's voice actress really sells the emotion in the ending. I loved her story as well as the tragic mystery of the alchemist. Even though we don't see a lot of him, you can tell he cared so much for his daughter and only wanted the best for her, and it was sweet seeing her realize that in the end. This ending also challenges the morals of these witch trials. Even though Jean didn't kill anyone, should she still be cast into the fire? Of course not. But this world is a twisted one, one that has so many questions yet to be answered by our protagonist. I really enjoyed this case. It's my favorite so far in this game because of the intense and heartfelt story being told throughout. Even though the investigative section was more streamlined than before, I still enjoyed it because I was able to really see the beauty of this game and witness some fun character interaction. The final case of this game spans over several chapters, and while I am ready to discuss some weird things about this game that I didn't like, I'm also excited to see what else this game can throw at me before we put these witch trials to bed. This final case was great. I loved so many things about it, but there are a few things that hold it back from being truly great to me. I really enjoyed the beginning where Phoenix, Luke, and Espella are all trying to deal with the loss of Maya and Leighton. It showcases some fun character moments between the three when they're all trying to cheer up, and it also shows new information on the witches when we see the witch from the first trial alive and well. Maya and Leighton's section was a fun time as well. The way they put their heads together to solve puzzles and uncover more clues was charming considering their contrasting personalities. I want to say I love the vibe the ruins give off. They're ancient rooms with plenty of inscriptions and traps to ward off trespassers. It feels like something straight out of the 3DS Professor Layton games, where the characters are investigating ancient civilizations. I wouldn't be surprised if that's where they got the inspiration for this section. The final witch trial was one of my favorite parts of this game. The atmosphere in the area it takes place and screams, this is the end, the final showdown, and I love that. And as much as I disliked the constant interruptions from random citizens in the previous cases, I can't say that I didn't somewhat like the beginning of the trial, where there are ten witnesses. It was fairly confusing, intentionally so, but also pretty funny. When I first played the game years ago, I wondered why it had a versus in the title. I mean, Leighton and Phoenix worked together throughout the entire game. And that's when Leighton takes the Inquisitor's Bench. To get closer to the truth, Leighton and Phoenix have to stand on opposite sides of the courtroom, and it was such a cool moment. The epilogue is where my worries lied. Was I overreacting and the ending was actually fine, or are there things worth criticizing? For starters, I did like most of the twists and facts revealed. Magic isn't real in this town, and is explained by the use of machinery and illusions. That was a really good payoff. I also liked when the storyteller explained that the water and foliage in the area contain certain substances that allow for people to be incredibly susceptible to what others tell them. It's a rather dark but fascinating concept to me, as well as the fact that the ancient bell is what caused the legendary fire. It's tragic, but again, I was actually interested in these reveals. My problems come in when the storyteller explains how and why all of this came to be. So, all of Labyrinthia was a government project with hundreds of volunteers, also the storyteller can lie to his daughter about the events of the fire? And everyone was 100% okay and on board with this, supposedly including his best friend who committed suicide because of this? This game takes place inside two series that have their own strange concepts. Spirituality? I'll buy that, because it's explained well throughout the games in an understandable way, and is even expanded upon in many ways. Advanced ancient civilizations? 
I'll buy that too, because the nature of these games make these mysteries and concepts believable. A government-funded PSYOP with hundreds of volunteers, the purpose of which is to lie to some random person's child about a tragedy? I can only suspend my disbelief so much when playing a game or watching a show, and this is one of the moments where I just plain don't get it. This man is a billionaire, and so is his friend who also had a traumatized daughter. I can think of so many ways to help these two kids in ways that are easily achievable and more realistic than this. What I also don't get is how the beginning of the game happened at all. The storyteller said that people need to be hypnotized or intake certain substances to see the witches, magic, and the other strange shenanigans that happen around Labyrinthia. So how does the introduction with the witches happen if they're just in regular old London, with no special substances or machinery? It doesn't make any sense. I've heard that the DLC tries to remedy these issues, but I think if you have to rely on DLC to vaguely explain plot holes, then you did a poor job initially setting up that plot point. Do these issues mean that this game is bad, that this case is bad? Absolutely not. I still thoroughly enjoyed it, and I actually found myself invested in many of the twists presented in the final trial. It's just I can only suspend my disbelief so much and accept what the game throws at me before I start asking questions. This case was a great end to a great crossover. The atmosphere and characters are amazing, many twists are actually dark and interesting, and it had that classic Ace Attorney and Professor Layton charm when going about solving these mysteries. It's my second favorite case in this game. I just loved the heart of the Alchemist case so much more. This case really is great, but it could have been even better if some twists were handled a bit better. Professor Layton vs. Phoenix Wright was a surprisingly fun time. I was skeptical to add this game in my list at all because of the nature of it. These aren't traditional cases and are hard to rank because of that. I was also worried about the ending and how it would impact my enjoyment of the game as a whole, but I still enjoyed almost every aspect of this game regardless of its structure and confusing plot points. The characters are fantastic, and I love how everyone interacts with one another. Their banner is easily one of my favorite parts of this game. The aesthetics and music are also beautiful. I really do think this crossover has some of the best visuals and songs out of both series. The cases were great and make for a wonderful experience as a whole. The setting changes how these characters solve the crimes they're presented with and make for some of my favorite mysteries to solve thus far. As a crossover, I think this game is simply amazing. Putting two of my favorite series in a new world makes for a fun time in general. If I had to have a few nitpicks, it would be that the puzzles weren't the most challenging, and even solving all 70 doesn't net any special rewards for the player. I also wish some more important characters had more screen time in the ending. Barnum doesn't show up in the finale at all, and Luke is only in cutscenes. Overall, it's a fun game with some fun cases. I love it. We now conclude the part of the video where we talk about the spin-offs. It's now time to return to the main series with new protagonists, new stories, and new cases. Alright, last thing. Look here and tell me there's a single straight woman in this image. We now arrive at the final trilogy, and for the start of a new character's journey, I think this case was okay. This is the start of Apollo's game, his story and his beginning, but he doesn't really do much in this case. The one who does most of the work is Phoenix, which is surprising since he's supposed to be the defendant. When Phoenix takes center stage, it is exciting, but you have to think about how this isn't even his game. Apollo does almost nothing during the trial, to the point where Phoenix says to humor him because he's the one with control over the case. To me, it's an issue that Apollo doesn't have much agency in this case, especially considering that ending. But it's not the end of the world. Phoenix being cool was still entertaining. It also adds a mysterious air to his character, where everyone brings up events from seven years ago that led to him turning in his badge. The case in general was a little simple, but that is to be expected. It's a new chapter for the series, so an easygoing tutorial makes sense. I will say the short section when everyone discusses the witness placements almost gave me a game over. I don't know if I'm just stupid or what, but that part was really confusing to me. As a tutorial and introductory case, I think this was a fun time overall. 
The mystery of Phoenix and Kristoff is really interesting and investing. It was also just cool to see Phoenix back in action, in a proper courtroom at least. I do have issues with Apollo's character though. I wish he had more input into what was happening during its first trial rather than sitting back and watching Phoenix work his magic. Even though Phoenix's first ever trial was beyond basic, he still did most of the work and didn't let Mia do everything for him. Apollo does almost the opposite, which doesn't show the best start to his story. It's a fun introductory case as a whole regardless of that. Not my favorite tutorial case, but it is up there. I don't remember this game as well as the others, so I wonder how the game will pick up from here. Quick tangent before I talk about this next case, but what wonderful timing on Capcom's part to announce the Apollo Justice Trilogy right in the middle of me making this project. As you can see, the footage I'm using isn't the best, but it works well enough for what I'm doing. I just wish someone out there recorded themselves playing the widescreen mobile versions of these games. That's how I played them at first, and they look better than the split-screen footage I'm forced to use. Oh well. I'm not gonna wait over a year to finish this project, just to have slightly better image quality in this video. At least I can change my Google Doc titles into ones that make a little more sense. I honestly don't have too many thoughts on this case. It's predictable, forgettable, and overall unenjoyable. It's not totally without merit. I love the dynamic between Trucy and Apollo, the noodle guy was entertaining, and Emma's return was very fun. But other than that, I don't care all too much for this one. My issues first arise when we have to deal with Trucy's problem, and then this guy shows up and he's revealed to be a weirdo, and then I happen to look at the game's manual and oh boy, doing this again, are we? I also have issues with Apollo. He still lets everyone do the work for him while he sits back and points out the obvious. During the first trial, I actually struggled to remember what he did. I more so remember Trucy and Clavier putting in the effort. What doesn't help is that the murder mystery is very predictable, and I don't know how Apollo struggles so much when I see everything coming a mile away. And that's without me already knowing what happens. I remember having the same problem when I played this game years ago. This random lady wants to marry into the mob for the money and wants her fiancé and anyone else who knows about her schemes dead? Who could have seen that coming? I don't want to be super negative on this case, but overall it's just not that great. I do see some interesting ideas, but they must have been executed poorly for the result to be an overall forgettable case. It's not bad, just below average, I suppose. Oh boy. We now have just an average case on our hands. I actually enjoyed this one a bit, but it is simply okay when comparing it to the other 25 or so cases I've talked about so far. I do like many aspects of it, but I probably like some more than others due to my hindsight. For example, I really liked Lamoire's character because I know who she is with context from the finale. I do like other aspects without hindsight though. Clavier being a central focus of the case was great to see because he's such a fun and chill person. He's also... I mean... Just, just look at him. He's the first rival character to not want the opposition dead. He simply pokes fun at Air Forehead sometimes. They actually work together a lot in this case. Apollo himself seems to pull a lot more weight when solving the murder mystery this time around, which was a nice change of pace from the previous two cases. With this case having a concert setting, I like how the mystery constantly plays with the environment it takes place in. Most major talking points and questions stem from one person hearing something or sounds happening when they shouldn't, and that seems fitting in a case revolving around the auditory arts. The crime itself wasn't too hard for me to figure out though. Once Lamoire accuses the killer, the mystery is basically solved. That could just be my hindsight again, but I actually forgot a lot of aspects from this case. I forgot Lamoire was actually blind, and I even forgot the killer's character existing. He's not all too memorable if I'm being honest, and neither is his motive for murder. And you could call this nitpicking, but I have to ask, why is the court trying to persecute this kid? He's, what, 12? I know Maya was 16 or 17 when she had her first trial, but this kid can barely be considered a teenager. The court never touches on his motives, his ability with high caliber firearms, or anything of the sort. I'm pretty sure the only reason they arrest him is because they found him passed out next to the body, which was also never explained. I just found his involvement to be... odd. I think this case is simply okay. There are a handful of aspects that I do enjoy about it, such as the characters and most of the murder mystery, but I didn't care all too much for the rest of it. I don't think it's below average like the previous case, just an average one. 
a straightforward, middle-of-the-road experience. This is easily the best case in this game, and it even rivals some of the previous finales in terms of my enjoyment. There are so many things that I love about it, but at the same time, there are a couple of things that I find a bit iffy. For starters, I love the atmosphere and tone of the initial murder mystery. The music and area investigated feel so depressing and they fit very well when considering who these people are and what they've done. The main feelings I get from this section are guilt and regret. And I'm sure it comes to no one's surprise that I also love the sections where we play this phoenix. We learn what he endured over the last seven years and how he lost his badge. It was actually a bit depressing seeing everyone take advantage of him, but it was just as cool seeing him sleuth to uncover the mysteries. Gameplay-wise, it was also just fun to play as him again. We have the Magatama once more and can reveal the secrets and motives of everyone important in this game, and it was pretty fun to me. The way we do this is via a simulation put together by Phoenix, and this is where my first nitpick comes into play. There's a part where this reporter gives Phoenix a photo. I always imagine his voice sound like Weird Al Yankovic, but anyways! He gives him the photo after the murder of the Forger. This case, of course, takes place well after the first one, where Zack Grammary is killed. So how does Phoenix get Zack to spill the beans by showing him that photo, which is from the present, after he's dead? The rest of the simulation works just fine, but that's the one part that sticks out to me. A less important detail is the mystery of who actually killed the magician. It's revealed to be a suicide, but if I'm being honest, I wish they just didn't reveal that detail. Both Zack and Valent are morally dubious individuals. Until the suicide is revealed, it could have gone either way as to who did it. It's nice that all loose ends are tied up, but I still liked how the game toyed with the player making them think it could be either person. It could have been interesting if they left it up to interpretation. A more important gripe is that Apollo, once again, doesn't do anything that important. He is capable in understanding and solving the mystery of the Forger's death during the first third of the case, but afterwards, Phoenix does all the work to solve the overall mystery of the game. During the final trial, I was left wanting more from his character, but it just felt like a big explanation from Phoenix summarized by Apollo. I've done a lot of nitpicking, but seriously, this case is great. I genuinely love solving the dark mysteries of Phoenix's past, the Grammaries, and the case as a whole. I haven't mentioned her much, but I genuinely love Emma during the investigations and using forensics to solve these mysteries. It's just nice to see her again in buttheads with Apollo and Trucy. I love everyone's dynamic between each other. My problems with this case are actually small in comparison to the rest of it. It really is great. It's dark, tense, mysterious, and it wraps up everything quite nicely by the end. In terms of finales, I do prefer Farewell My Turnabout and Bridge to the Turnabout over this one. They're simply too hype and have yet to be topped. Overall, this case really is good, but there is one thing I cannot overlook. This was the very last time we saw Detective Gumshoe. I still have no clue why, but I had a tear rolling down my face when his final testimony in the series was given. I have so many feelings that I want to put into words, but I cannot say anything more. Actions speak louder than words, and I think we should all do ourselves a favor and pour one out for him. Anyway, I like this one. Apollo Justice Ace Attorney was a good game overall. I genuinely enjoyed my time with it, and I'm glad to see the series telling a new story with new characters and mysteries. The cases by themselves are all mostly good, apart from one that I simply don't care for. But other than that, they make for a fun game to experience. The one thing I was left feeling after the game was finished was a want for more. I wanted to see these characters explored in more detail, their personalities, motivations, and relationships. I wanted to see many ideas further expanded upon, such as Phoenix's fatherly relationship with Trucy, the Black Cyclops on Kristoff, 
and how the jury system would affect future cases in the series. And as much as I complained about Apollo, I have to give credit where it's due. This is his first game, and the writers did what they could with him while also juggling Phoenix's character. I'm sure there were so many things they had up their sleeves for these characters and ideas. Of course they couldn't cram all of them into one game. That's what sequels are for, and I'm sure they would have gone the same route as the original trilogy and expanded upon these points in future entries. That is what they do in the next game, right? Despite my previous sentence, I don't want to make it seem like this game is bad. I want to give each one the benefit of the doubt regardless of my previous opinions on them. I actually remember liking this game a lot when I first played it, but not as much as the years went on. Regardless, I still want to give each game a fair chance as I revisit them. I want to say right out the gate, the presentation of this game is great. The visuals are great and I love the character models and how expressive they are. The 2D artwork is just as good. It just feels like an upgraded version of the DS games. The animated cutscenes are also amazing. They're packed with great character moments and animation. They're done by the same team who animated Mob Psycho 100. I just finished binging that show recently and their work is stellar. The music also slaps. If there's one thing I've always thought about the game, it's that the soundtrack is so good. I just love the general feel of the game right out the gate. For the case itself, it's okay. We're introduced to a new lawyer, Athena, which was surprising to me even when I played the game for the first time ever. We only just got introduced to Apollo, and now we're introduced to another integral character so soon after. I don't think that's inherently a criticism. I really like Athena and her expressive personality, but it is something I noticed. It has been forever since the game showed us who the killer was in the introduction, which makes this case even simpler to solve than a lot of other tutorials. Not entirely a criticism again, but it does make it so that this case is less interesting and memorable than the others, both in solving the case and how enjoyable it is. I think the only two reasons people would find this case memorable is because of the courthouse bombing and Apollo's attire. What did they do to you, man? This case is just okay to me. It's not bad or forgettable, but just not too interesting to me. I have to give credit to it for establishing the feel and atmosphere of the game, and I really like Athena's character. But the rest of the case is just... meh. This is the tutorial, though. They tend to be pretty simple. I'm sure the rest of the game will be a lot more interesting. You know, maybe the killer was kind of base for bombing the courthouse. I think we should follow in his footsteps every time the Supreme Court makes a ridiculous decision. This case was also just okay to me. There's nothing that I absolutely don't like about it, but at the same time, it doesn't do anything all too special. I don't want to sound like a broken record. I hate repeating myself when I try to write about things that I enjoy. But the cases that aren't story-focused in the last couple of games have just been okay to me. Again, that doesn't mean they're bad, but there's nothing that I want to passionately discuss about them. Either that, or the things that I do like have to have an asterisk next to them. I'm getting ahead of myself. I think this case is overall okay, but I did enjoy a handful of things about it. I enjoyed seeing Athena again. The way she and Apollo bounce off each other was one of my favorite things about the case. Their personalities clash and mesh very well with one another. I also liked seeing their interactions with Phoenix. Now that he's done being ominous and secretive, we can actually see him mentor the two, offering actual advice instead of cryptic messages. Another thing I love about Athena in general is her character-specific gameplay. Phoenix is able to see the secrets people hide from others, Apollo can tell when a person is lying through their mannerisms, and now Athena can sense when a person's emotions cloud their judgment and memories. I really like the idea of using one's emotional state to uncover the truth. It feels like a perfect fit in this series because of what these people are already capable of. Another character I really liked was Simon Blackwell. His design and character is so cool. I love him. He uses psychology and mental tricks in a similar way to Athena, except, you know, instead of helping people, he just gaslights them. I just love the beginning of the second trial. Simon gaslighting the judge was so funny. I was initially disappointed that Emma wasn't the detective in this game, but Fulbright was a positive for this case. He's so over the top and goofy, how can you not like this guy? Surely he's just a whimsical man who believes in justice. 
Surely, the rest of the case was just okay. We get a reveal of the killer again, which makes the murder mystery even less interesting. I love a good locked room mystery, but revealing the killer takes the fun out of it. I didn't have a problem when they revealed the killers at the very beginning of the series. It was the very start and I still enjoyed those cases. But at this point in the series, I think they should just... stop doing that. We're eight games in. I think they know by now how to write engaging stories and mysteries without revealing the answers at the start. This case as a whole is just okay. There are things that I enjoy about it and things that I don't, and the rest I just don't care for. It is better than the previous case, but that's only because this is a full case rather than a tutorial. Hopefully the next one can pick up the pace. This game seems to be a constant stream of just okay cases. I do enjoy each one a little bit more than the previous, but these cases have all just been fine overall. Again, I hate sounding like a broken record, but that's just what I felt like when playing through these games. I really enjoyed playing as Athena for the entire case this time. Seeing her way of thinking on full display as well as her determination was nice to see. I also liked Phoenix. He hasn't had that big of a role in the game, but he has some good moments in this case. I've seen many people say that in this game his personality shifts right back to how he was in the original trilogy, completely ignoring what he went through during the previous game. But I disagree with that sentiment. In that game, we mostly see him from Apollo's perspective, which is why he seems so different and dark in the eyes of the player. He was acting like that on purpose. When we do play as Phoenix, we see his original personality shine through, meaning his new mysterious air was just a facade. In this game, we see that he actually has grown and matured over the years, especially when starting the initial investigation in this case. He immediately starts searching the scene methodically and naturally, showing how different he is at handling these situations compared to the original games. I just like Phoenix in this game. He strikes a good balance in showing his maturity when handling cases, and in showing his real personality when he interacts with others. Clavier was a surprise, but I can't help but dislike him a bit because of how he's written. It kind of feels like they didn't want him in this game, but they simply had to put him in somewhere because this is a sequel to Apollo Justice. He also has a completely new voice. I'm sorry, I liked you as Spider-Man Mr. Yuri Lowenthal, but you do not fit this German prosecutor. The rest of this case was just okay. I don't care for the rest of the characters of the big murder mystery. The first two cases showed who the killers were, making them pretty simple to solve. And the killer in this case is so obvious right from the start that this one also falls into that category. People always poke fun at the extraterritorial rights in the investigation games. But I don't see nearly as many people talking about the ends justify the means in this case. If this guy could go two sentences without saying that phrase and making that ridiculous face, then maybe he would be slightly less obvious as the killer. I did somewhat like him though when he goes full Spartan mode during the last segment of the trial. That was kind of funny. I did not like the high school drama aspects of the case. Almost no progress is made in the trials and investigations until the last second because we have to listen to the latest gossip. They even comment on this during the first trial, how this case is literally just a high school drama. I have talked about cases that had character focused narratives, but I don't care for these people. I have to ask also before I move on, if the mystery is solved because they figured out that a giant staff was used to kill the victim, how did the police not notice? The original murder weapon is a small art tool, nowhere near as long or thick as the staff that the killer uses. They should have known immediately if something that large was actually the murder weapon, or if something that large was plunged into the victim's side at all. This case is just okay like before. I like some of the characters, but the murder mystery wasn't all that investing. We've now reached the halfway point. I hope the game can actually pick up the pace this time. I really don't want to end this section by saying this was mid the game. I actually like this case. To be fair, it's just above average in my eyes, but after the past several cases, it's a welcome change. It's also one of the shorter cases, making it easier to digest, but there's still a good amount to discuss. I like the vibe the case brings with everything revolving around space. It's not the first theme one thinks of when talking about this series, but I still think it's an interesting one. I like the spacecrafts, the futuristic rooms, the robots, these over-the-top space witnesses. I think it's a fun theme to have for a case. I also like the murder mystery for once. It's another locked room mystery, and exposing every little detail gets you closer to finding the truth behind it. 
That phrase can be applied to literally every case ever, but I still enjoy the mystery here. The second trial has that in spades, when the director constantly changes his testimony and more and more issues come up that are solved rationally. This is the type of stuff I like to see. I haven't mentioned it yet, but many of the trials and investigations have felt almost automated. But I don't remember getting that feeling during this case. I also enjoy almost every character here, for better or worse. The three main attorneys are always great, but Apollo sticks out the most. The victim was his best friend, and his emotions are bottled up inside until he lets it all out at the end of the investigation. It's a very realistic reaction given the circumstances. Anyone would feel the same way if this happened to someone they cared for. Although, if this person was so important to Apollo, why is this the first time we've heard of him? He wasn't mentioned at all during the previous game, and yet Apollo can't seem to stop talking about him here. Just another writing quirk in this trilogy, I guess. I still love Simon. He's such a great character. I love his dark samurai personality and how he constantly gaslights the judge. I wish the judge had a witty remark about Simon's joke, though. He's literally had ghosts and spirits as witnesses in the past. This case also has a wild ending. Only two other cases come to mind that have an abrupt ending, but this case has an actual cliffhanger. It's so chaotic and completely flips everything we've learned about so far. I love how tense everything is. The ending was so wild that I'm actually going to continue the game right after I finish the next couple of sentences. This case was overall above average, but it's still pretty enjoyable. I really like the case's atmosphere, the murder mystery, and the way it handles characters. Again, just above average when comparing it to everything else I've talked about, but I still like it. Do not play Ace Attorney finales in basically one sitting. Worst mistake of my life. This case and the previous are the main story-driven cases of the game, and I think that's why I enjoy them so much. I know I've been bad at describing my enjoyment of the murder mysteries, but I really did enjoy the overall mystery of these two cases, and the Phantom. These games always have points where the characters talk about thinking outside the box, and that idea is applied heavily to this case because of what they're dealing with. They've already dealt with so many different people in their schemes, but never have they dealt with a person who operates this far beyond the human psyche. The mastermind of these two cases is the Phantom an emotionless international spy who does so many awful things to conceal their identity. The sole reason they killed Athena's mother and pinned the crime on Simon was because she found a way to reveal their identity, and every subsequent incident has been to hide their crimes. The courtroom bombing, the rocket sabotage, all the big story moments were caused by this emotionless psychopath, and I just think that's really cool. Another thing I really like is their witness breakdown. In my opinion, it's one of the most unsettling breakdowns in the series, all because of the stellar animation. If this was a 2D game, it wouldn't be nearly as disturbing. The way the eyes bulge out of their sockets with the rest of the mask melting is terrible but in the best possible way. Injustice we trusted, Jesus. The one complaint I have about this reveal is that it feels like it comes out of nowhere when considering how Fulbright acts in the rest of the game. I guess it is kind of clever. The most overtly emotional character turns out to be an emotionless husk. The characters were also a highlight, and as much as I absolutely love Athena and Simon, I want to discuss Apollo and Phoenix. I know for a fact they didn't want Apollo's character to be a younger, louder Phoenix with all the same ideologies, and I like how this case clashes the two to show how different they can really be. Phoenix believes in others until the very end, but it's in Apollo's nature to doubt people. I really like how both of their views are discussed, and how they're both technically correct. You can't have faith in someone without the initial doubt, but to truly have faith in someone you have to believe in them. Edgeworth returns, which is very cool, but I'm sorry, I cannot stand his voice. His voice during the cutscenes is perfect, but his voice in-game sounds like an old man. I don't mind the voice of anybody else in the game, but Clavier and Edgeworth stick out like sore thumbs. I am sorry. With the overall story and ending, I like how they actually talk about the Dark Age of the Law, instead of it being a buzzword with no real meaning besides, the courts are evil now. The cases of Phoenix and Simon are the reason why the Dark Age began, and I like how the game tries to end hopefully after what they've been through and inadvertently caused. This case is called Turnabout for Tomorrow. 
because after Simon's false charges are overturned and Phoenix's evidence scandal is resolved, there can now be hope for the trials of tomorrow. I really enjoyed this case. It's not my favorite finale, obviously, but I still really enjoy it. I love the crazy mystery behind the Phantom, the overall murder mysteries and how the psychology aspect of this game plays into that, the great characters and character moments, and I actually like the main themes and story. We would move straight to the conclusion, but we're not quite done yet. We've cross-examined assassins, argued with the president, and have even taken down an international spy. Now get ready to defend a killer whale. This truly is the only M-rated Ace Attorney game. I like this case too. I think it's my second favorite of this game. I do want to talk about this case, but I kind of have to start off with a negative involving the game as a whole. The structure of this game is just so weird. I'm playing this case after what was supposed to be the ending, which makes a lot of stuff feel off in this one. Fulbright is still here, acting as chipper as ever despite us already knowing what he actually is, and Simon is still the convicted prosecutor. It's hard to put into words, but there are a lot of moments that feel off in this game because of how it's structured. Even if you already know why and when these moments happen, playing the cases themselves in chronological order still feels weird. The order these cases actually go in is 2, 3, 6, 4, 1, 4 again, and 5. It doesn't take rocket science to see that the structure of this game is simply goofy. Despite that, I still really enjoy this case. It's just a fun time with a solid murder mystery and a strong self-contained story. This is one of the very few cases in the series where the cause of death was actually an accident. I love how this case shows that everything was an accident and no one was really at fault. The trainer from a year before had a heart attack. She wasn't killed by the orca. And the current victim wasn't murdered by anyone. He slipped and fell from an absurdly high spot. The reason I love the accidental aspect of the case is because it makes it unique and memorable. There were no bad guys, and it was all a misunderstanding on everybody's part. I also like that aspect because it's ironic. Phoenix and Athena are so determined to find evidence of a human culprit, but there never was a culprit in the first place. What I also enjoy about this case are its characters. Only a few cases in this game have had good characters, and this is one of them. All of their personalities and motivations are fun and realistic. I love these guys. The same goes for Athena. I love her energy, and I wholeheartedly agree with her when she's around the penguins. I really like the atmosphere, too. First we venture into space, and now we're talking to Orcus. One part I don't entirely like or understand, though, is Pearl's inclusion. The same goes for the finale. I really don't get why she's here. She offers nothing important. It's hard to believe, but she has more screen time in this case than what Trucy had in the entire game. Why was Trucy shafted so hard? Am I gonna have to make a tribute to her too? Also, you cannot tell me that Pearl is older than Trucy. It's impossible. Look at them side by side. Even though the structure of this game causes the case to be weird in the beginning, I still really enjoy this one. And that's saying something because half of the game has generally felt like a chore. I'm glad to end it on a good note. The premise is strange, but fits right at home in this series. The truth behind everything was realistic and shows that sometimes accidents happen. And I like the general atmosphere with the characters and visuals. Overall, I like this one. Not the best way to end this game, but I still enjoy it. So this is why I should read One Piece. Dual Destinies is just okay to me. I don't think this is a bad game or anything. But overall, it's just okay for more reasons than one. The cases themselves range from just okay to great. The first half is overall simple and sometimes boring. I was actually worried the whole game would be that way. However, the second half picks up the pace and I enjoyed those cases in a lot more ways besides I generally like the main characters. The cases themselves are one thing, but I still have issues with the game as a whole. I've already touched on its structure, but did you notice how I barely mentioned Apollo, Trucy, or anything related to the previous game? It was all about Athena. Athena, Athena, Athena. They shouldn't have put Phoenix's name in the title, or even Apollo's. It should have been Athena's. This really is her game. I don't think that's a bad thing. I still love Athena, and I did enjoy the main story this game tried to tell. But to do that, they threw away everything that was set up previously to make way for Athena's story. To create a proper sequel to Apollo Justice, 
and in turn create a cohesive and investing trilogy of games just like the originals, you would have to axe Athena's character entirely and put the focus back on Apollo. As a sequel, this game isn't the best because it ignores almost everything established in the previous. Which also means the next game is going to have a hard time trying to tie all of this together to create a trilogy worth experiencing. Am I less than optimistic for the next game because of this? Yes. But we will keep pressing on. Before we jump into this game, I want to talk about a first for the series, an animated prologue. I think it's a cool thing to do, showing the events before the start of the game before it's even released, while also not making it necessary to see before starting it. It's just fun and I enjoyed it. Athena, why are you eating the evidence? Starting the case itself, it's okay. Again, I'm starting to see a pattern here. Like the tutorial before, I really like how the atmosphere and tone are shown. It somehow surpasses the previous game's aesthetic and I like it. I also like how insane the legal system is in this new country Phoenix is in. I don't know how legal some of this stuff would be in real life, but here, it works and I find it interesting. It's bizarre and very in your face, but I still think it's interesting seeing how these people act, and how much they rely on spiritual practices in court. I also think the new Divination Seance is a neat and fitting addition for where Phoenix is now, but actually using it can be a bit iffy. Finding the right words and sentences all while the video is playing can get confusing at times. There's so much to pay attention to, but it's still a fitting addition. The murder mystery itself was just boring to me if I'm being honest. The killers revealed in the introduction, again, I'm getting tired of this. The main talking point is theft and who would be able to steal this treasure. And once Jesus makes his appearance, it's already over. I'm not typing his actual name. Without the divination seance, the first person to be suspected should be the one who takes care of the treasure itself. But no, we're suspecting a child. It also just dawned on me. I know this country has different legal practices than where Phoenix is from, but if they thought the treasure itself was the murder weapon, why didn't they check for fingerprints? They would have known instantly if it was a weapon or not, and whether or not to suspect the kid. This case is just okay to me. I like the tone and atmosphere of the game so far, both in its visuals and story, but the majority of the case and its mystery just aren't for me. I guess it is better than the previous game's tutorial, but that's really not saying much. I hope I'm not sounding super negative. I was admittedly in a bad mood when writing about this case, but this one is just okay. I am so glad to say this was actually a good case. I was worried we'd start seeing a pattern just like last time after the okay tutorial, but no, this case was just good and I really like it. I love how the main focus here is put on Trucy and her magic. Trucy? Being an important character? I may need to check my pulse. Her whole character in this case is wonderful. She has many great moments during the investigation and trial. She always wants to find a way to keep others smiling, but this whole situation takes a toll on her. There have been a few times during this project where I got teary-eyed, and the moment Trucy burst into tears was one of them. I also like her character because there's a lot more focus put on her tricks and skills, rather than simply being jokes at Apollo's expense. Seeing her perform actual illusions and learning how they're done was fun, and the same goes for the rest of this magical group. I like the bunny girls and their teleportation tricks, and the killer shows off some impressive skill during the trial. Emma returning, again, was also a highlight. I love her character and seeing her truly happy instead of stressed and grumpy 24-7 was great. She's finally a full-fledged forensic investigator and that made me happy. Like you go girl, analyze those fingerprints and bloodstains. The most okay part of this case to me was the new prosecutor, Nayuta. I don't care for him a ton if I'm being honest. He just talks about the Holy Mother while telling everyone to go to hell every two minutes. Not that the latter is any different from the usual, but still I think he's just fine. Something else I did like were the stakes. The investigation is so tense because of the killer constantly making threats, along with Apollo and Athena worrying about Trucy. It feels like there are actual stakes in this case. Touching back on the illusory aspects, I really like how they all relate back to the murder mystery. 
The killer using the secrets behind every illusion and trick to commit murder makes solving the case pretty fun. If the answer was as simple as him stabbing the victim and hiding the body, it would be a huge letdown in a case revolving around magic. Making the victim fly straight into his own murder weapon? Now that's a lot more interesting and fitting. This case is really good and accomplishes pretty much everything it sets out to do. The characters were great and they all have solid moments and interactions. I liked magic being the main theme because it gave Trucy time to shine and makes the murder mystery itself interesting. That focus on magic also makes this case a great follow-up to the story of the Grammaries during Apollo Justice. This is definitely one of the better cases, and I hope they can keep up this momentum. This game seems to be a lot better than the previous with its pacing and the cases themselves. I don't know if I like this one more or less than the previous though, I had an equally fun time with both. The main selling point here is the return of Maya, and it was just great to see her again. She's the same old Maya at heart, but we see she has grown since the last time we saw her. She offers words of wisdom and encouragement to the princess after she realizes what the divination seance was used for, but she doesn't skip a beat when talking about the Steel Samurai and potential crossovers. I also like how she impacts the trial. In earlier cases, you may have asked yourself why doesn't she simply channel the victim's spirit so they can explain what happened. The answers could be because of misunderstandings like in DL6, or the victim having something to hide such as this case. The first victim was a member of the secret police who captured and killed those who rebelled against the regime, so the quote unquote culprit killed him out of self-defense. The second death was a suicide made to cover up for his wife as to not cast suspicion onto her, though this did lead to Maya being arrested. I really like Maya's channeling in this case because of all these twists and motives that keep even the dead from wanting to talk. If Maya does channel victims, I would prefer this approach. Instead of immediately saying who killed them, I find it more interesting if they have something to hide. I was worried about how this backwards legal system and the rebellion would be discussed. I didn't know if it would be more in your face like the tutorial, or if it'd be investing and believable. It is interesting to me though, and I actually like where they're going with this story. Everything happened in this case because of those for and against these incredibly messed up laws and acts. Say what you will about the law in previous cases, but the laws in this country drive people to do bad things to send a message, regardless of intent. And after the ending of this case, it seems like actual change in this system may be underway, with the start of a legal revolution. I didn't think I'd actually be interested in a story like this, but here I am. It is time for me to nitpick aspects of the case that no one would care about except for me. A staple of this series are the name puns. They're almost always clever while also sounding like actual names. This game though, I'm gonna be honest, has had some pretty bad name puns. Not only were the puns in the previous case not subtle at all, but they aren't even trying with the names in Kurain. Pronounce all of these names and words out loud and you'll see what I mean. The first victim's real name is quite literally real name. This whole tangent doesn't take anything away from this case, but man do these name puns suck. This case is good just like the previous. I really like it and everything it sets out to do. Maya's return is probably the best part and I really like how she and her abilities are utilized. The motives and twists behind the murder mystery were believable and interesting and I actually found myself invested in the story of the rebellion. I didn't like the name puns, but that's not on this case, that's more so on the game itself. I may have liked the previous case more than this one, but I really don't know. It could go either way, I like them equally. All in all, a good time just like before. I've been waiting so long to talk about this one, waiting for the opportunity to be able to talk about something awful again. It's just fun to rip on bad things sometimes, what can I say? Is this case's reputation deserved? Do we finally have a case that's as straight up bad as Big Top? Well, let's talk about it. This case isn't downright terrible, it's just a nothing case. A nothing sandwich, if you will. The characters and their interactions are all very weak, the murder mystery is forgettable and is solved in a flash, and I can't think of anything I actually liked about it. Everyone treats Athena like she has no idea what she's doing. Yes, she is still new at this, but that doesn't mean she's incompetent at her job. Simon treats her like she's never held a trial before, and Nayuta doesn't even acknowledge her existence. 
Speaking of Nayuta, he has no reason to be here after just finishing the trial on Kurain. He adds nothing aside from the usual burn in the fires of hell talk. I would have much preferred if Simon were the prosecutor here. That way he and Athena could go toe to toe for the first time with nothing holding the two back. Again, Athena is not stupid or anything, but this case sure makes it seem like she is. She really got the short end of the stick in this game. The defendant is bad. I don't care for the main witness at all, and I don't think I need to tell you why I don't like the killer herself. Her character is like a slap in the face, taking you by surprise and leaving you saying, why did you do that? Stop it. That's like the fourth time today. Something else I didn't like were the long discussions on old Japanese culture and entertainment. It's not that I don't find that stuff interesting, far from it, but that's not what I'm playing these games for. A good portion of this case is all about Rakugo and different types of Japanese food. If I wanted to learn about these things, I wouldn't play a game about murder mysteries. This case isn't the worst thing in the world, again. It's just... nothing. There's nothing to really like and enjoy, but there's nothing to outright hate about it either. None of the characters are handled that well, and the case-specific cast is just... bad. I tried to put it lightly, but these are just bad characters. The defendant is gross, the one witness is a joke, and the killer is weird and bad and I don't like any of them. The murder mystery wasn't interesting and if the first half didn't revolve around D.I.D., it would have been solved even faster than it already is. When the witness says the word perfume, it is over. The atmosphere was also not great. Learning about Rakugo is interesting, but don't have that take up a majority of the case. Easily goes to the bottom of this game. And on the overall list, it's sure to be near the bottom. Like I said, a nothing sandwich. This case is great, and is the best in this game because that's just how this works. I really did enjoy this one though. I like the locker mysteries of the main murders. The stories wrapped up very well, and the characters were great. I sound like I'm checking boxes on a clipboard, but these are things these games do best. As much as I like this ending, I want to talk about a few things I didn't entirely enjoy. This case is very long, and that's because it's essentially split into two parts. The first being a civil case where Apollo and Phoenix go against each other in court, with the second taking place in Kurain, where we wrap up the story. I've always thought that this case could have taken the Dual Destinies approach, where the fourth and fifth cases are two halves of the same story. I think this case would have been better paced if the civil part replaced the fourth case entirely, and left the Kurain stuff all in the finale. I feel bad saying that because Athena would have even less cases to her name, but would people really be that heartbroken if this case didn't... exist? Another issue I have with the first half is that it's just farewell my turnabout again. Maya is taken hostage, Phoenix has to defend a clearly guilty person, the killer realizes they lost, it's a pretty blatant comparison if you ask me. I also have issue with the post credit scene, where Phoenix talks to Lavoir. I love her inclusion, but Phoenix is just now wanting to tell Apollo and Trucy that they're lost siblings. Now? After Apollo is out of the country, thousands of miles away, now is the right time to tell them? And we don't even get to see their reactions. This is the last time we see Apollo in this series, and we don't even see that resolution? I've complained a good bit, but don't get me wrong, I really did enjoy this case. These issues do make it so that this ending isn't the best it could possibly be, but it's still a fun time. The first half has a pretty obvious murder mystery, this politician is not subtle in the slightest, but the second half has a much more investing murder mystery and story. Yeah, the killer here is also pretty obvious, but uncovering the truth behind everything was very satisfying. In particular, I like the part where it's revealed Dirk is dead, but everyone is still deliberating whether or not he did it in spirit. Is this queen that bent on crushing the rebellion, to the point she's indicting a ghost? It's absurd, but I still found it entertaining. I also like that they don't even try to debate if the justice minister killed Dirk or not, everyone just accepts it. I enjoyed solving the mystery behind Apollo's father's death because that one revelation is the final nail in the coffin for the queen. Hey, Knightley, you weren't the only one with this idea. The scale and story of this case was just as entertaining. We've gone from exposing corrupt individuals to overthrowing an entire monarch. That is wild. 
Apollo has finally come into his own, and this case shows a lot of great moments and growth from him. He has his own way of finding the truth just like those around him, and he shows his resolve by taking Phoenix and Dirk's words and advice to heart. He's great in this case. I will say his overall arc in these three games was pretty messy, but I still enjoyed his character and growth shown here. This case really is great. I thought the murder mysteries were investing and fun to solve, the rebellion story was wrapped up nicely, and there were a lot of great character moments. There were a handful of things I didn't like, I admit I complained more than I would have wanted, but this is still a great case and a good ending to this game. As an ending to the overall trilogy, eh, but it's still a great time all around. This is the final case in the story of Phoenix Wright, and it's a fun one. The one complaint I have here is that Trucy and Athena are barely in it. This case is essentially fan service for the original games in a lot of ways, but I wish they went even further with that fan service y feel with Maya and Trucy specifically. It had been almost 10 years since Maya was in a mainline game, and because of that, I wish they used her in more ways besides being the same old Maya. It was such a missed opportunity not having her and Trucy interact. This would have been the perfect time to have some Auntie Maya moments since we never saw them together in game. Aside from that, though, this case is just fun. It's short and sweet, but full of great character interaction, another strong, self contained story, a well executed murder mystery, and it's just fun. It is such a fun time, I cannot state that enough. I enjoyed every minute I spent playing this case. It's also incredibly cheesy in its theming and how characters talk about the subject of love and marriage, but I don't care, that makes me love it even more. I was smiling so hard when the judge married the defendant and her fiancé. It's so dang cheesy, but so fun. Well done indeed, your honor. The characters were a major highlight. This is why I said the case is basically fanservice. Phoenix, Maya, Edgeworth, even Larry is back. You haven't heard his name in two hours. And they're all once again butting heads trying to solve this mystery and uncover the truth. Some of my favorite moments were from all of them interacting and having fun, or insulting each other in court. The characters are just great, but I still wish we got more from Trucy and Maya. That's just a me thing. The story being told in this case was so good. Everything from character motivations to how the story itself unfolds is amazing. I just think it's interesting and well paced. Everything stems from when the killer lost his fiance in a car crash, and his whole character and motivation behind the mystery hits so much harder in a case themed around a romance. He is a bit twisted, sure, but it's not hard to feel for him at the same time. Solving the crime itself was handled pretty well. Because this case takes place on a blimp, you'd think there'd be a big secret behind it showing how these characters move from place to place, but no. The fabled power of love negates that. That doesn't mean the mystery isn't there, and I really enjoy learning how the killer quickly orchestrates his plans the second the defendant acts in self-defense. This guy literally kills a man in the middle of a wedding, how can you not find that fun to figure out? This case is great. It's definitely one of my favorite normal cases. Obviously I enjoy the story-driven cases more, but that doesn't discredit the fact that this one was just fun. The characters were great and I love their banner. This case has so many memorable and fun moments between each of them. The story and mystery being told and unraveled respectively was also great. Everything is revealed in a believable and interesting way, with the story itself being one of the stronger ones. It's also a cheesy case, but again, I don't care. I wholeheartedly enjoy the tone of it and it makes for a lot of entertaining and sweet moments. I'd say this is a good way to end Phoenix's story, with a short and sweet case that's a fun time to be had on every front. Spirit of Justice is a definite improvement from its predecessor. The cases are all mostly good, and overall, I enjoyed my time with it. The tutorial was just okay, and that fourth case is definitely near the bottom of the list for me, but everything else is at the very least good, and I'm okay with that. As a whole, this game is good, and I do enjoy it. But for the end of this trilogy, it does leave a bit to be desired. In these three games, characters, ideas, and plot points have flip-flopped in importance and relevance, leaving a lack of cohesion by the end of it all. Yes, that is mostly the fault of Dual Destinies. And yes, again, this game did try to return the focus to things that were more important than others. 
but both of those points don't detract from the fact that the end product of this trilogy is an unfocused batch of games that won't leave the player with the same level of satisfaction and enjoyment as the original trilogy. I want to reiterate, this game does try to return the focus onto things that actually need focus, but I wouldn't say it does it in the best way. From there being a secret fourth of Grammary that was never mentioned in Apollo Justice, to Apollo himself having like five backstories that each feel shoehorned in, there are so many ideas that are just thrown out there with the goal of saying, look, we didn't actually forget about these characters and plot points. These ideas don't have any real impact or intrigue because they literally come out of nowhere. I really did enjoy this game, don't get me wrong. I complained way too much in this conclusion, I admit. But the end of this trilogy leaves a fair bit to be desired with how so many things were handled, especially compared to those first few games. I said a few minutes ago that this was the end of Phoenix Wright's story, but we still have one last game to discuss. It's time to throw the past two and a half hours out the window, folks. I have a feeling this next one will be something great. This is the last stop on this ride, and we're ending it on what many have claimed to be one of, if not the best game in the series. Well, games, plural, but we'll get to that. I've been so excited to talk about this game and explore every nook and cranny of it. It's the most recent game in the series and by far the most attached. You don't have to play or know anything about the other games to have a fun time here. For the start of a brand new story, I'd say this case does a great job. It is such a good introduction on so many levels. It's also a long one, but I really don't mind. It doesn't feel bloated or poorly paced like other long cases. The length here is perfect for establishing everything we're about to experience. Oh boy, time to see how white I really am. We play as Ryu Nosuke Naruhodo, ancestor to Phoenix Wright, and he is such a great character right from the start. He is incredibly nervous and has almost no interest in being a lawyer, but also has a real knack for cross-examinations and revealing contradictions. His friend, Kazuma, is also a great character for giving Ryunosuke the push he needs and helping him in court. He's also an interesting character in his own right, where everyone talks about him traveling to Great Britain to learn more about the legal world, as well as this mysterious mission of his. Pretty much every character that appears here is great. Everyone is so well written, and this is only the tutorial! I am pumped. The tone and atmosphere are also fantastic. Not only is the setting interesting because of the time period, but visually, this game is amazing. From the character models and animation, to little things like dynamic camera shots, there is so much to appreciate in just this introduction alone. The music is also great. I know that's a given, but this game has some amazing songs, so let me tell you. The murder mystery here is also very interesting, and everything develops naturally as time goes on. The killer is obvious once Ryunosuke reveals a second person was at the victim's table, but that doesn't make solving the case any less fun. I felt like such a genius even when revealing little things, such as the victim going to the dentist, and it was just as satisfying figuring out the more important things such as the poisoning and the stakes being switched. It's just a fun mystery to solve, I enjoyed my time here. This case is one of the best introductory cases and should be what other tutorials strive for. It's just a great time to be had. The characters are great, the plot points introduced are actually interesting to me, the tone and atmosphere are established very well, and the murder mystery itself was just fun to solve. I am confident that this is the start of a truly great experience. Another really solid case. I'm having a fun time with this game so far. This case is just an investigation, but dare I say it, this case might be better than a majority of the ones from the games built solely around investigating. There is so much to unpack and love, just like the introduction. I really can't think of anything I didn't like. The victim this time is Kazuma, and his death gives a similar feeling to when Mia died in the first game. The main characters just lost someone very important to them, and now it's their job to find out what happened. But I think this case handles that topic much better than how that first one did. It's hard to put into words, but everything is handled with the severity and maturity it deserves. Characters react naturally, the mood of the situation is expertly shown. 
you understand the importance of what's happened. I just like how the tone is established. You can actually feel the weight of the situation and the motivations of these characters feel real. The characters themselves are strong just like last time, and develop naturally as the case goes on. Ryunosuke and Sasato's dynamic was believable because they just lost someone dear to them, and Ryunosuke is suspected by Sasato. They aren't immediate best friends like Phoenix and Maya in the first game. They have to build trust in one another while also dealing with the loss of their friend. Their dynamic by the end is believable because we've watched the two throughout the whole case. The way they interact feels genuine. Everyone is well written. Not just the main cast, but side characters are just as great. You can feel the struggles of the Russian ballerina as well as her relationship with the crew members. I love these characters so much. We're still only in the tutorial phase and they're already this strong. The best part though is not the mature mood, nor is it the well-written characters and their dynamics. That honor goes to one Herlock Sholmes. He is easily my favorite part of this case. There have been times where I smirked at character remarks, maybe even chuckled, but Sholmes is the only character in this series to consistently make me laugh to the point of tears. He is the funniest character, I can't state that enough. Every time he's on screen, you know you're in for a fun time. Not only is he constantly hilarious, but he also adds a great gameplay mechanic. The Dance of Deduction. It is funny seeing him make wrong assumptions, but it's a good sequence in its own right because we can use these deductions to further advance the murder mystery. It may sound unimportant to learn about the ballerina's cat, but these points are key to learning the truth behind Kazuma's death. Sholmes is just a fun character. He's consistently funny and his dance of deduction is a great mechanic. He may sound flawed at times, but when he's on the mark, he's really on the mark. I can see why Sasato would fangirl over him. I'm also glad they called him Sholmes in the translation instead of Holmes. The name really fits his character. This is a Holmes. This is a Sholmes. This case is another solid experience. The story and atmosphere are handled incredibly well, the characters are just as well written as before, and need I say more about Mr. Sholmes? I wonder how the next case will pick up from here, now that we're out of the tutorial phase. It is becoming increasingly harder to find more ways to say this case was really good too. It really is good again, but I prefer the others over this one. They were stronger cases overall and felt more complete, whereas this case ends rather abruptly. That is because of the story being told here, but it still feels like we were only just getting started before the verdict was handed down. Despite that, this case is still great just like the ones before, and I really like the story and mystery even if I have a small issue with the pacing. This case really makes you feel bad for defending someone. Throughout the trial, Ryunosuke defends with everything he's got so he can continue Kazuma's mission in London, and he succeeds. The defendant is found not guilty, but not without using some deceptive tactics. It feels like the trial was a waste of time because everyone was being led on by the defendant, and by the end it's really hard to tell whether or not he's actually innocent. Evidence is tampered with, statements become almost meaningless, all because of this devious man and he gets to walk free. Well, not really, he gets his comeuppance, don't worry. It's because of this story that I had some issue with the pacing of this case. Everything just ends with nothing resolved. The story is really enjoyable and interesting, don't get me wrong, but it also lessens my enjoyment of the case as a whole. It's like that one case with Mia where the story is interesting, but said story grinds the case itself to a halt. I really like the jury system introduced here. While the judge can deliver his own verdict, the opinions of the public also influence said verdict. It's an interesting system where anything can completely flip how the jury perceives the defendant. One second they'll want him dead, and the next they'll think he's a saint. It feels like it's trying to expand upon the jury system shown in Apollo Justice. While the main gamers did forget about it, this one can rectify the idea without worrying about any continuity issues. It also introduces a neat mechanic where you have to pit the jurors against each other to change their viewpoints or show contradictions. I just realized this is ripped straight from Professor Layton vs. Phoenix Wright, but it's still pretty neat. Something else ripped from that game was the concept of multiple witnesses on the stand. 
It works the same way as before. Witnesses try to pin the blame on one person, but they sometimes strip up their words with others listening. Both games were built around this system, but I prefer its use here. It feels more fitting. Overall, another solid case, but it is on the lesser end of this game for me. As much as I really do enjoy the story and the scheming done by the defendant, that story causes the pacing of this case to be a bit off. It starts and ends with almost nothing being resolved. We're left with more questions than answers. That is the point, but again, that causes this case to be weaker than others. It's not as complete as I would have wanted it to be. I still really like the story though, as well as the new gameplay mechanics introduced. I didn't mention them much, but the characters were also really good. That's just a given at this point though. Perhaps all this case needed to be another great one was a little dose of Sholmes. The first full-fledged case in this game, and we're already almost done with it. That is wild. This is definitely an improvement from before though. It's a much more complete case with a more interesting and investing mystery. Solving everything in this case is even more satisfying than the first two because we now have a full investigative section and trial, rather than only having one or the other. It's a well-paced mystery during both sections, but I do admit not a ton happens during the investigation aside from the usual Sholmes happenings. I still like the investigation though because we see a lot of fun moments between Ryanosuke and Sasato. Banner like this is one of the best parts of these games. I especially love how sassy Sasato is. She's great. A moment I also like is when Ryunosuke talks to the defendant at the end of the investigation, where he talks about what he believes in. It's a small but natural development in his character, talking about believing in himself and his own instincts before anything else. Whereas Phoenix has that blind trust in his clients, it's a nice change to have Ryunosuke put his own thoughts and instincts first, especially after that last case. The one part during the trial I didn't care for was when the police officer and his wife take the stand. I just feel like they're used longer than they should have been, but everything else was great. I like the jury sections where their testimonies reveal new possibilities for the current case. From the old man falling down in the street, to the construction worker talking about knives being thrown at him. These anecdotes feel like natural additions to the current mystery they're trying to solve. Van Zeeks was fun during the trial too, and I liked how he helps Ryunosuke solve the mystery during the ending. Feels a little reminiscent of a certain other pair. I also like how everything was an accident. Kind of. This lady did throw several things out the window during a fire. At least no one died this time. This is the first case with a good ending in this game. The tutorial case ended without knowing the real truth, the second was just depressing, the previous was shrouded in mystery, but this ends on an actual good note. Until Shulm starts talking while giving a deadpan stare. That actually made me a little uneasy. I really don't know why, but I'm struggling to think of what else to talk about here. I hate to make this so short, but I guess my thoughts are simple this time around. This is another great case. It was well paced in its investigation and trial sections, the characters were great as always, and the mystery itself was satisfying and fun to solve. I do prefer the first two cases over this one though, but I really mean it when I say every one of these is great in some way. This is the best case in the game so far. Almost every aspect is great in some way. There are a couple iffy points we'll get into later, but it's still a genuinely great time. This case ties heavily back to the one with the omnibus, and I really like how both cases tell a dark and investing story. The omnibus case was shrouded in mystery all because of the defendant and its monetarily evil ways, but this case takes the time to explain what really happened. The defendant was actually the killer, and Ryunosuke successfully defended him, allowing him to walk free. This had never happened before in the series. Every defendant was actually innocent, and the real culprits always got their just desserts. I find that very interesting on its own, but the schemes of the defendant are the reason why this case occurred at all. He worked together with a current case's killer to steal and sell government secrets, and with his death, the current killer had to erase evidence, culminating in him shooting the latest victim. I just find this setup very interesting and it was satisfying to unravel it all. The murder mystery was also great and I had a fun time solving it. I will say the whole cross-eyed aspect of the case was a bit in your face, 
but it's a small gripe and it actually helps advance the case in clever ways. The thieves were just joke characters, they constantly give themselves away, but the trial becomes a lot more interesting when the real killer takes the stand. I think the murder itself was easy enough to solve. What I enjoyed solving the most was everything to do with the big government secrets. I really enjoyed learning the ins and outs of how the secrets were distributed, as well as the motives of everyone involved in this situation. Gregson's reactions were both very funny and believable. You can tell he's serious and means business by just how loud he screams, hold it. Ryunosuke was great as always. Sasato and her struggles were believable. Sholmes is... Sholmes. And Iris was fun throughout the whole case. She's barely been in the game so far, but she shines in this case through her interactions with literally everyone. Gina, as the defendant, was also great. She's such a strong character, and all of her motives and actions are believable. The only reason she became involved in the situation was because she wanted to help Iris. She's a good person at heart, even if she doesn't want to show it. Something small I want to bring up is the Hound of the Baskervilles. If you're a nerd like me, you'll know that title is the story of the death of Sherlock Holmes. It's very interesting to have that story be an integral point in a different story where a similar character is still alive. I mean, Sholmes does get shot, but that's not what I'm referring to. He's very secretive on the subject, and that gets the player to wonder what it's actually about. This case is great on so many levels, but I still have issues with the fact it is also an ending. This is the end of the first great Ace Attorney, but it feels like it ends way too soon. Throughout the game, many points and ideas were introduced with the intention of being expanded upon, but almost none of them were by the end of this case. If anything, you're left with more questions than answers, especially with that Morse code message containing Kazuma's name. It's hard to enjoy this game on its own because it's structured to be the first of two parts. If I looked at the two separately, I would find this ending a bit disappointing, because so many things are never explained by the credits. Kazuma's secret mission, random side characters, the Baskerville story, Van Zeke's being a racist. So many things are set up but are never paid off. These points are expanded upon in the next game, but it still leaves a lacking feeling when looking at them as separate experiences. It feels more natural to instead talk about them as one package. This isn't the ending to the first game, it's the halfway point of the full adventure. I just wanted to bring that up because I see how some would be disappointed by this ending when looking at these as separate experiences, but I'm going to cheat and talk about them as one game instead of two. This case is great. I enjoyed unraveling the story, the murder mystery was fun to solve even if a little simple from some angles, and the characters were all fantastic. There are some issues with the ending itself, but it doesn't affect me that much. I am cheating talking about two games at once, but it makes more sense to me that way. Fun time all around, and now we're heading back to square one. The very last tutorial case in this series, and I'm glad it's a short and sweet one. It's just good, not super impressive or groundbreaking, but it is a good time. I love being able to play Sasato defending her friend in court. It's a concept that's been done a hundred times, but I like the spin they add here. Women were treated poorly all throughout history when it came to literally anything, so Sasato being in a Japanese court at all was cool to see, even if she has to wear a disguise. The disguise itself allows for some fun moments, where she tries to be overly manly or when people call her dashing and handsome. There are also the moments when Rei calls her dashing and handsome, but I think there's more to it when she says it. I mean, she's blushing all the time, even while knowing it's a disguise. Need I say more? I also like during court where Sasato understands how pressured Ryunosuke is. Her eyes are ready to burst out of her head. I want to point out the amazing music in this case. This entire game has had some wonderful songs, but I genuinely love these themes for Sasato in court. They are so good, I love their tone and how the instruments are used. I swear I could gush over this soundtrack longer than anyone should. New story information was nice to see. Learning Sasato's father might be involved in the incident with Kazuma, or at least knows something about it. I don't know where this idea is headed, but I am invested. I also like seeing reactions to the government bending over backwards for a murderer. 
It's interesting seeing everyone's views on the matter. The premise and theming of this case are probably the best parts about it. The rest is just alright to me. The murder mystery is interesting because of who the victim is, but solving it isn't all that fun. I think it comes down to the fact I over-examined every piece of evidence the second I got a chance, and then I saw the logo on the pen earlier than I should've. That's not really a bad thing until you see that same logo on the sleeve of someone in the background, and then everything falls into place from there. It takes out the thrill of finding the killer, even if it's just the tutorial. I did like the ironic aspect of this scheme. The victim who used poison to kill someone died by poison herself. The lacking mystery is made up by the killer's motive. It's very understandable why he goes this far after everything that happened in that very first trial. Murder is still, you know, bad, but you can understand why he did it. If the government won't deliver justice, someone has to. The last thing I want to mention is that the ending with Auchi made me laugh harder than I'm willing to admit. It's so somber and hilarious at the same time. I mean it when I say this is the best interpretation of a pain-centric character. He's not entirely incompetent and can be an actual threat at times, and the jokes poking fun at him actually land. This is a good case overall. The premise, theming, and characters are easily the best parts here, but the mystery itself is a bit lacking. That is probably my fault again for examining everything a bit too much, but it's not the most investing thing in the world in my opinion. I was going to say this is my least favorite case in this game, but when thinking about it, I think I enjoy this one more than the Omnibus case. What will the game throw at us next, I wonder? Because I have no idea. I have a confession to make. I've never actually finished this game before. Yes, yes, I know, but hear me out! Every other game I've played once before, and I replayed all of them for this project. But I don't know why, I never had the motivation to finish this one. I remember after Sholmes' deduction, I didn't have the motivation to continue. Which is weird, because I remember having a good time. It's been almost two years since then. I will finish the game this time around. I'll also try my best to not let recency bias affect my opinions. Just because something's new and cool to me doesn't mean it's the best thing out there. I first want to tell myself a few days ago that yes, those songs were just for Sasato. Rinosuke still has his old themes. But I actually think that gives further reason to play these as one game. They both have the same songs, graphics, characters, plot points. There's not much to differentiate the two aside from a few additions here and there. With the case itself, it's once again really good. I think it's better than the previous involving the cat-like defendant. It's also a much darker case when looking at the story and mystery, which is surprising when both cases have virtually the same cast. I really enjoyed solving the mystery, but it was a little simple at the same time. With the Sherlock Holmes-style introduction, you immediately get the impression that this sham of an actor isn't to be trusted and everything begins to fall into place when the jurors discuss gas and how blowing into pipes can affect things around the house. It's just a bit simple to me when looking at the main mystery and overarching plot, but that's not really a bad thing. I honestly wasn't too big of a fan of the jury gameplay in this case. There were several points that can contradict one another even without pressing, like when they all say the victim is an honest citizen but someone else says he's a thief. Or when the old man talks about another method of poisoning, and then another person talks about gas being dangerous. It makes sense for the jurors to discuss their points first before putting them against each other, but it felt like there were some contradictions in there. I think the parts that stuck out to me the most were the ones that didn't even involve the case itself, mostly concerning Sholmes. In the beginning, he has no intention of discussing the case with Ryunosuke and Iris and in the ending of the case itself, he acts suspicious around this collar. A bloody collar with the letter B as an emblem that causes Sholmes to forbid Iris from writing about the case entirely. What animals usually wear collars? And what animal have we heard of already that involves the letter B? Hmm, the gears are starting to turn in my head. I may have talked bad about this case a little, but it really is another solid one. The mystery is both dark and investing. The motives of everyone involved are realistic, even if their intentions are all a bit murderous. 
The themes and story also get pretty heavy at times, but in a way that makes me even more invested than the previous plot involving these people. Solving the case itself was both simple and frustrating at times, but it's still a fun time to be had. I was also very invested in the brief but tense moments involving Sholmes. It makes you wonder what he's up to and what he's hiding. I'm glad I'm actually finishing this game, because this was another great time all around. Again, I'll do my best to not let recency bias affect these last few cases, but I'm also excited to see what they have in store. I know I just said I don't want recency bias to affect my thoughts on these last few cases, but man, this might actually be my new favorite of the game so far. There's so much to unpack and I can't think of anything I didn't like about it. There was one moment I didn't entirely enjoy, and that was when you had to present a camera on the engineer's statement. Except I tried to present it before some mandatory pressing. That's kind of my fault if you think about it, so really everything here was fun. The game has been hyping up this grand exhibition ever since the start, and this case is at the epicenter of the event. I will admit the main murder mystery is thrown in the background during the second half, but it's still such a fun time. Everything hinges on the defendant's teleportation machine and whether or not it actually works. Both arguments make reasonable sense and it seems like it could go either way at first. As the trial goes on though, it's all too apparent that some sort of trick was used. This is the late 1800s, of course teleportation won't work, but it was still really fun learning the trick behind this grand illusion. The main mystery takes a back seat when the big trick is proposed, and we shift the focus towards the professor. I enjoyed learning the story behind the professor and the aftermath of his case. It's another dark plot point, and I was invested in even the smallest bits of new information. It was also interesting to me because the scars left behind from that incident are why this case occurred at all. And does the word professor seem familiar? And wouldn't you know it, the professor used a certain large canine companion to commit his crimes. Hmm... I want to highlight Sholmes' deductions once again because they are always one of the best parts of each case they're in. They have charming and witty character interaction, they're consistently hilarious, and they're full of well-choreographed shots and animation. I've generally said the look of this game is more cinematic than others, but the camera angles and movement during these moments are always top-notch. The editing of these shots are also very well done, from Sholmes' visualization of the scene to when he changes the subject at the snap of a finger. I also want to mention one small moment when the game plays a subdued version of the Pursuit theme, and how it transitions into the more energetic version. It's such a great moment. That transition captures the feeling of finding the truth once and for all perfectly. I loved every aspect of this case, I mean that, but I think what I enjoyed most were its characters and story. Apart from the professor, I also really enjoyed learning so much about Van Zeeks. His genuine character, backstory, personality, anything to do with him was fantastic. We see that he's not actually a racist, but that he was betrayed by a friend who took the life of his brother, and that event shaped who he is today. It was also just fun seeing him in the investigations, especially in his office. Of course the wine cellar is full of corpses, Ryunosuke. You're not wide off the mark at all. The other important character I really liked was Kazuma. Yes, the same Kazuma who supposedly died at the start of the game. We don't see a ton of him, but that ending was crazy. His father was actually the professor, and he's training to be a prosecutor under Van Zeeks? I will say I'm not the biggest fan of motion capture in these games, and I'm not a huge fan of their voices aside from Van Zeeks. But that final cutscene was an insane way to end this case. It is so good, I cannot understate that. This case is great on so many levels. I genuinely loved every aspect of it. I have a habit of repeating my thoughts on the case at the end in a sort of conclusion sentence, but really this case was just great. And I went through this whole paragraph without mentioning Gina. She's back and she's also great. We have two cases left. I have no idea what's in store for either of them, but I am excited. I would like to mention the spooky French witch lady, peak character design and concept.
Moving on. Can we take a moment to appreciate how crazy this title is? It is so cool I can't describe it. This case is, once again, good. If I had a dollar for every time I've said that during this project, I would have a lot of money. It really is good, but I have to say I enjoyed the previous cases more than this one. It feels a lot more expository in comparison to the others. I don't think that's a bad thing by any means. I think it actually helps with the pacing of the game as a whole. But when looking at the case on its own, it's not as thoroughly enjoyable as others. I also wasn't the biggest fan of the two redheads during the trial. I get they're supposed to add some levity to the situation, but I just wasn't a fan. The biggest thing that sticks out is the death of Gregson, and it's treated with the severity it deserves. You can feel the emotion in the air very easily. Everyone's reactions are believable and justified. Especially Gina's. You feel for her more than anyone else. It was also very interesting having Van Zeeks be the defendant in this case. After the previous, he's opened up a fair bit and we learn a lot of important information from him alone, mostly concerning the legend of the Reaper. Not only was it wild learning the very first killer was using a fake name, but it was even more hectic learning she was actually an assassin called Asa Shin. I will dock points for that name pun, but it's still a huge development. It was just as interesting learning Sasata's father was actually Sholmes' partner back in the day. It was hinted at before, but it was still a very interesting twist, even if it creates implications worthy of a Susato takedown. Do you see what I meant when I said this case is full of exposition and explanations? The more I think about it, the less I enjoy this as an actual case. Don't get me wrong, I enjoy it just as much as the rest of the game, but it does feel like an explanation type case. The murder mystery itself is hardly talked about aside from the first investigation. The rest of the case is full of explanations about other characters and their past. I make it seem like a bad thing when it's really not. I still enjoy this case, but it does feel more like exposition before the finale and less like an actual case. I really don't mind because I do enjoy these reveals, but at the same time I am looking at this as a full-fledged case just like the rest. I hate to make this short, but unlike last time where my thoughts ran dry, I'm just itching to continue the game again. We have one last case to discuss, and I'm excited to finally finish this. Both the game itself, and the journey of playing these games. This case was just as great as the others, but when looking at it on its own, it does leave a bit to be desired. I sound like I don't like it, but again, I'm looking at this as a full-fledged case. Not only as the rising action to the climax. I have now finished every single case in the Ace Attorney series, and that ending to the Great Ace Attorney Chronicles, holy shit! <laughs>
and this case is full of evidence of that. Some of my favorite moments of his are when he and Sasato's father perform a no-nonsense dance of deduction, and when he shows up as a hologram in court. This has to be my favorite deduction in the entire game. That sense of urgency, that killer song, the fact we play as Sasato's father. There is so much to love in this short section, and I had a very fun time. Who knew tap dancing could go so hard? I just glossed over Sholmes being a hologram, so allow me to question, how has he invented so many things that are far beyond his time? He's almost perfected forensics, and now he's creating things that even we haven't made yet. Call it absurd, but I love how absurd it is. I was stunned when a grainy Sholmes popped up asking, Have you heard of a telephone? I also like how despite his apparent clumsiness, Sholmes is a genuinely smart person and deduces the events of the entire trial. Some may call it lazy writing, saying he's only smart when it's convenient, but I call it a great detective's intuition, and in that he's been one step ahead throughout the entire game. The murder of Gregson is sadly solved rather quickly, but the rest of the case focusing on the conspiracy behind the Professor and the Reaper was very interesting. When this guy suddenly becomes the judge trying to hurry things along, the main villain becomes a little on the nose, but I can't understate the thrill of uncovering every minor detail. Forged evidence and altered autopsies, hidden documents as a bargaining chip, constant orders from the very top, all of these controlled variables were helmed by one man, and it was very satisfying to finally take him down. It was just as satisfying and hilarious to have the queen herself revoke his place of power, all thanks to our deductive friend. There is so much to love about this case, I can't stress that enough. It's such a great finale to this game. So many character arcs are wrapped up, there's a plethora of exciting and entertaining moments, the main mysteries and conspiracies are deep and investing, I could go on and on. I may actually like this case more than Farewell My Turnabout. This is an actual conclusion, whereas that case was a hype fest. A very enjoyable hype fest, mind, but I do prefer this case and how it expertly wraps up this adventure. I really, really enjoyed this case, as well as my time with the game as a whole. It's a little sad for it to end, but it ends on a very high note. What do you mean Herlock Sholmes was at Buckingham Palace talking to Queen Victoria while dancing as a hologram? The Great Ace Attorney Chronicles may be the single best Ace Attorney game. I get it's cheating to say that. You could just as easily say the same about the original trilogy because it also got a standalone release. But there is a difference. Those first three games are each distinct from one another. You can easily talk about one without bringing up the others. And like I said earlier, these two are built to be experienced as one complete package. And I mean it when I say this is probably my favorite game overall. The characters are incredibly strong and well written, the mysteries and conspiracies have interesting and detailed plots, the overall story is entertaining on almost every level, the tone and atmosphere are expertly displayed, and I have to say this game has some of the best tracks in the entire series. I swear, almost everything is great in some way, which is fitting given the title. The cases themselves are all enjoyable in some way, and I can't think of a single one I didn't like. My biggest complaint was that a couple of cases were just good in my opinion, and that says something about the game's overall quality. I'm glad this is where the rankings end. Like I said a minute ago, it ends on a very high note. If any of these games deserve to be played, it has to be this one. It's completely disconnected from the rest, so there's nothing to catch up on, and it's simply a great time to be had all around. And now, we have nothing to move on to. I've played and discussed every game in every case. I guess there is one last thing to talk about. This final list and how I would rank these cases from worst to best. Before we begin the final ranking, why don't we rank the games themselves first? After the last three hours, I'm sure you can tell I enjoy some games more than others, but I thought it'd be a harmless addition. Now, just because I list one game lower than others doesn't mean it's downright terrible or that you should skip it. As much as I complained about some games and cases, I still think there's something to enjoy in every one of them. 
from worst to best, here's how I would rank every game in the Ace Attorney series. Miles Edgeworth Investigations Dual Destinies Spirit of Justice Justice for All Phoenix Wright Ace Attorney Apollo Justice Ace Attorney Professor Layton vs. Phoenix Wright Prosecutor's Path Trials and Tribulations and The Great Ace Attorney Chronicles I'd say this ranking is pretty fair based on what I've said beforehand, but if I have to separate The Great Ace Attorney into two parts, I just sandwich Prosecutor's Path right in the middle of them, like Adventures, Prosecutor's Path, Resolve. Now, for what I've been looking forward to ever since the start, my personal ranking of every single case. It's been a long road, and after several hours of thought, I think I came up with a good list that, again, fits with what I've said in this video already. Just like before, here is my ranking of every Ace Attorney case. Hey, let's play a game. Take a shot every time I say the word turnabout. This video was sponsored by Water. Turnabout Big Top. Because yes, I am that petty. The Lost Turnabout. The Kidnapped Turnabout. Turnabout Ablaze. Turnabout Storyteller. Turnabout Countdown. The Foreign Turnabout. Turnabout Reminiscence. The Monstrous Turnabout. Turnabout Visitor. Turnabout Corner. Turnabout Academy. The First Turnabout. Turnabout Airlines. Turnabout Sisters. Reunion and Turnabout. The Imprisoned Turnabout. Turnabout Target. The English Turnabout. Turnabout Serenade. Recipe for Turnabout. Turnabout Samurai. The Cosmic Turnabout. The Adventure of the Runaway Room. The Stolen Turnabout. Turnabout Beginnings, The Fire Witch, The Adventure of the Blossoming Attorney, The Rite of Turnabout, The Adventure of the Clouded Kokoro, The Magical Turnabout, Turnabout Reclaimed, The Forgotten Turnabout, The Adventure of the Great Departure, The Adventure of the Unbreakable Speckled Band, Twisted Karma, and His Last Bow. Insert GIF of man riding fire. Turnabout Memories. Turnabout Time Traveler. The Final Story. Rise from the Ashes. The Memoirs of the Clouded Kokoro. Turnabout Trump. The Golden Turnabout. The Grand Turnabout. Turnabout Revolution. Turnabout Goodbyes. The Inherited Turnabout. Turnabout Succession. Turnabout for Tomorrow. The Adventure of the Unspeakable Story. The Return of the Great Departed Soul. Farewell, my turnabout. The Resolve of Ryunosuke Naruhodo. And, finally, Bridge to the Turnabout. And for those who are fans of tier list and not list list, a tier list of this exact ranking should appear on screen right about now. And there you have it. My thoughts on every single case in game, and my final ranking of each. I guarantee my friends are very happy it's over so I can stop updating them on my progress. I first want to give massive thanks to those who record themselves playing these games, as well as those who upload the soundtracks online. It would be impossible for me to record several hundred hours of gameplay all for a three hour project, I don't even have a capture card, and I don't know the first thing about ripping music from games. This video wouldn't have been possible without them. I love this series, and I hope this video showed that. There were some ups, some downs, some points of stagnation, but overall I had a blast revisiting every one of these games and being able to talk about them in detail. If you're one of the few who watched this video without playing these games, please take the time to do so. Preferably not within a year like me, you will go insane, but every one of these games has something to offer, even if some more than others. If all goes according to plan and I do release this video on the series anniversary, I guarantee the Phoenix Wright Trilogy and the Great Ace Attorney Chronicles will be on sale. And with the Apollo Justice Trilogy right around the corner, there hasn't been an easier time to get into this series. You may have some trouble trying to play the investigation games in the crossover. Something about this should be illegal. But need you be reminded that it's easy to hack your 3DS? 
Seriously, it is easy. It took me and my friend an hour to hack this one, and we spent half of that time trying to rip the back off. I hope that after the Apollo Justice Trilogy releases, we get some news on the future of this series. It's been seven years since the last mainline entry, and we've only gotten compilations since then. However, with the return of a certain other mystery classic dormant for many years, I'm sure Ace Attorney will be following not long afterwards. Here's hoping, at least. That's right, baby! This was all a roundabout way to advertise the hit game Ghost Trick Phantom Detective, now available on all major platforms. Yes! I love Ghost Trick! Cecil Sweet!